Well, I'm excited today to be with Clive Vanderberg. And Clive, you just have had an incredible career as a composer, a writer, a producer, a musician, a professor, and a television creator. And I know that there's many people that are going to be watching out in Cyberland that are excited to hear a little bit about your story. So I, I figured we could just jump right in and maybe hear a little bit about your childhood. Tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up and whether or not you came from a creative family. I, uh, I came from a family of uh, educators. My dad was uh, assistant deputy minister of the of Ministry of Education in Ontario. My mom was a teacher and a lifelong learner, and so they were phenomenally uh, supportive of myself and my brother in in doing all sorts of creative things and you know academic things as well. So I feel blessed with that. It's amazing. What things from your childhood influence your creativity as an adult? Were there any specific books or television shows or, or movies that had a long-lasting imprint or a significant role on influencing your artistry? Um, I, there were... I, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking of this the other day. The, uh, there were two television shows that I remember. I, I remember watching uh, uh, The Mickey Mouse Club, and it had, uh, it had a, a, a segment on it called Spin and Marty which was a, a video adventure, I think, you know, 10 minutes uh, once a week. And I remember really looking forward to that and thinking how cool it was to watch adventures of young people in, in this show. So they had a studio segment uh, uh, too, but uh, it, was the, it was a film adventure that I, I loved. And the other one, that, the other show that I think really had an impact on me was The Lone Ranger. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting. The, 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 there was one show where they explained how the Lone Ranger got his mask, how he got his badge, why he was alone. You know, I think there was a silver bullet, I think all that kind of stuff. And I just, I just think, oh, my goodness, that was such a cool show. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it, it, uh, it showed up in a number of the shows that I, uh, I worked on just because I thought it, it resonated so strongly with me. Wow. I, I had, uh, I, you know, I, I lived in a very... You know, it was a suburban environment, but it was very creative. We had a, we had just an absolutely wonderful scout troop that put on a show every year, uh, and uh, you know, wrote original songs and and original scripts and costumes and that kind of stuff. We had the most fantastic scoutmasters who were all brilliant uh, men. You know, all had PhDs or MDs, but they were they would spend all this time with 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 us as scouts. You know doing all scout things too, but also putting on this show. And I learned an awful lot about, um, about uh, putting on a show from, uh, uh, from uh, that, you know. Wow. It was and great. How old would have you been when you were experiencing that? I started, you know, uh, 9 and 10, that kind of thing, you know, being a cub and then going into scouts. And, uh, uh, you know, I did it for the next uh, five or six years. And uh, these, were just, these were just such brilliant people that was... Uh, uh, you, you just couldn't you couldn't help but enjoy being with them, and that was you know it was the era of folk music and whatever, and so there, uh, all these songs and singing around the campfire, and it's I mean it's shocking how how that has affected, you know the the, the you know loving music and learning how to learning chord structure and learning right. harmonies and all right. that that kind of stuff. Perhaps not as uh, as uh, formally as uh, some of the academic training I took but but it you know it bypassed the brain and went straight to the heart it's amazing speaking of academic training what can you tell us about what your formal training actually is in and where did you go to school I went to uh, the University of Toronto I have an undergraduate degree there a BA from there uh, I uh, uh, I have a master's degree for, in communications from Syracuse University where I you know, I learned some of the you know the formal theories of uh, of uh, television production. I have an ARCT in solo performance piano. Uh, you know, so I've uh, I've uh, played uh, Swans on the Lake all the way up to Beethoven. So uh, wow. and uh, studied all that theory that went that went with it. So it's kind of that that combination of things that uh, that gave me a kind of broad background of the stuff that goes into media production. And you know what, it's, it's really unique, just the background that you have. You seem to be just really well-versed and have just a lot of different experiences and a, di a lot of different talents that you've used over the years. Let's talk a little bit about um, 
kind of where you where you ended up in those early days. When did you become employed by uh, TV Ontario, or what was originally called the OCEA, and how did this all come about? Tell us the story behind that. Um, I had uh, uh, when I was in undergraduate school, I uh, I did uh, I was part of a, a group that did a, a network television show for the CBC, and I also did a network television. Net network radio show for the CBC for three years. And uh, so after I'd finished my graduate degree in Syracuse, I came back to Toronto with my wife and, uh, and I was looking for work and uh, educational television was a relatively new operation at that time. I mean, I think it started in 67, but, um, but it was still fairly young and uh, I was lucky enough because of the performance background, the academic background, uh, uh, to be hired by them to help out on some shows. I mean, you know, give you some idea of how I, how I started out. My first day on the job, I was uh, three-hole punching scripts, so, so <laughs> that was, you know, I don't think you needed a master's degree for that, but <laughs> I learned an awful lot by being surrounded by, you know, phenomenally talented, creative people. And when you think of those phenomenally talented, creative people, who, who were those people that made just an instant imprint on you? And what shows do you remember having arrived there at that time that you were helping with? Well, um, I mean, the person that made the greatest impact on me was Ruth Vernon. I didn't work with Ruth until, uh, until about four or five years being there, but she, would, she took over as head of, uh, head of children's programming, probably, you know, uh, from pre- to grade six or so, I think was her was her uh, uh, her area. But she was, you know, she had been a phenomenal educator. Uh, she was a great boss. She she had phenomenally high standards. She cared desperately about children and knew how to develop curriculum. Uh, she had, you know, it was her vision that created the uh, you know the richness uh, of of. TV Ontario and all those great programs that happened in the uh, in the seventies at, at uh, TV Ontario. She had the she had the the managerial school uh, skills and the and the toughness to be able to create an environment where uh, a whole group, you know, there's there's four or five producers and directors that uh, that worked with her for you know for a decade or a decade and a half that just uh, that all benefited from uh, from her talents. Wow. Do you remember any of the names of those producers and directors that stick out to you? Yeah, well, the, um, uh, Heather Conkey was one. Uh, people know her. You know, she did, she did a whole bunch of shows for TV Ontario, and I ended up writing uh, all sorts of uh, big-time uh, 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 network shows as well. Uh, Jed Mackay, um, uh, Jeremy Pollock, um, um, you know, those were the... Those, those people, Jeremy did uh, uh, read along and read all about it, and Jed McKay did join in and polka dot door, and um, and they all were, uh, you know, it was it was a time of great collaboration, time of great uh, uh, opportunity, and these were bright people who were given opportunities uh, uh, within you know within TV Ontario within the public sector to. Uh, uh, to try new things, you know, and some of the, you know, some of the greatest educational shows uh, ever produced were produced with those people. Yeah. Wow, wow. Now, when you remember coming in as a young buck and, you know, doing your three-hole punching, what were some of the first shows that you remember kind of being assigned to, to help out in some way, maybe not as a writer, but having some kind of, you know, even if it was just doing legwork for it, do you remember some of those early shows that you would have participated in? I did. I I didn't start in children's television. I started. Uh, my boss at the time, uh, Dr. Vera Novakowski, was in charge of preschool programming and uh, and adult education, uh, and uh, or teacher education. And so some of the first programs I worked in uh, were, were helping people in teacher education. And there was a show called Well, Here We All Are, and it was it was a show that uh, it was a it was a fantastic show. Written with um, unusual language and like a like a different kind of language base and a different a different musical base, quite quite uh, modal in its music and mm. and because I had the because I had the musical training, I was able to 
the, the producer of the show, Ted Regan, uh, asked me to work on it so I could help, you know, teach the the crew, teach the actors, you know, what the songs were because it was it'd be it'd be stuff that you'd know, Travis, you know, because of your back musical background and, uh, uh, but it was it, it was kind of kind of plain song and operatic and uh, and whatever and uh, so you know I, I you know I, I taught them to learn it by rote and uh, and so so and it, it was a phenomenally successful show from a creative point of view now the Globe and Mail critic said it was so bad that uh, that all TV Ontario's previous credits uh, credits should be erased based on this show, but he was wrong. You know, it was just it was so original, it was right. so different, uh, it was kind of phenomenal. And that was you know that was one of the wonderful things about TV Ontario at that time. There were, you know, they they tried things that you know that I haven't I haven't seen since uh, since that time. You know, we've all kind of, um, we've become a little more conservative in television and uh, and the forms have become more established but it, in the early 70s, boy, they, they, were, they were exploring an awful lot of uh, uh, interesting things at the time. It, it was a time when like anything was possible. When you look back and you think of the shows that you either created or wrote for, I'm sure the list is quite long, but um, maybe just rattle off some of the titles that even some of the people viewing this may recall. Everything from children's programming to, to other programming. Certainly, most would probably remember today's special, but aside from today's special, um, what were some of the other shows that you created or worked on or wrote for? The first show I, uh, I uh, created was a show called Cucumber. And uh, it... Um, uh, it was, yeah, it was a, a, a lovely show. I, I loved it. I did Cucumber, I did Math Patrol, I did Math Makers, I did Roots and Wings, I did McCabe Mysteries, I did Music Inc. I, you know, I, I directed a number of other things. I did a couple of hundred segments for Sesame Street. So, um, you know, uh, freelancing with the CBC, but but those were the those were the primarily the shows that I did at TV Ontario. Now, Cucumber was with Moose and Beaver. And I, I know that yes. there's been one one rare clip that has surfaced that had an actor from SCTV in it, and I can't remember. Do you remember who it was that made a cameo? Was it uh, Mar Marty Short? Was the uh, uh, was it, the show started with um, with two live people, Marty Short and Heather Conkey, and uh, and then had Moose and Beaver. Um, uh, I know John Stalker was Beaver, who was one of the the top. Uh, voiceover people in the country, and and I can't remember who played Moose. And when we went to series, that was the pilot. And we went to series. Uh, uh, we decided to uh, eliminate the live performers and go with Moose and Beaver. So, so I I take some credit in the fact that Marty Short wasn't tied up doing cucumber. He was allowed to go off and and uh, become. Uh, you know the Marty Short that we all know and love. You know, so uh, how many episodes of Cucumber <laughs> he were? He uh... did come back, Cucumber, and he did uh, he did a guest role as Smokey the Hare. Oh, okay, <laughs> very yeah. good. How many episodes yeah. of Cucumber were made? We did twenty six. Okay, very good. So we did. Uh, it was again a great time. You talked about the time at TV Ontario, but it was a time in Toronto where so many of the Second City people were just you know were just starting up. So. You know, to to be able to cast John Candy as Weatherman and Marty Short as Smokey the Hair, and uh, um, well, you know, there were there were all sorts of people there that were just you know, um, you know, were fabulous. And in that, well, here we all are. Uh, um, uh, there were lots of you know phenomenally talented people too earlier. And do you? Um, it in terms of uh, in terms of cucumber, when it would have aired, would this be like the mid seventies, early seventies? What what dates would you put on that if you were to guess? I would think you know seventy three, seventy four, the the seventy four, seventy five, maybe. Uh, there was a there had been a, a a program for kids in grade four to six that was uh, that was put on that was. Uh, Bill Hartley produced it, and Jim Calistro was part of it, and uh, uh, that was a uh, just a uh, was a really really terrific 
variety show for kids. And so my boss, who was responsible for kids somewhat younger than that, wanted to do a show as well and so asked me if I could come up with a show that would, that would be kind of like that, that other show. And, uh, um, uh, and so we had that, developed that sensibility around, around ecological respect and, um, and teaching children about, um, you know, about themes around ecology and, and uh, that kind of thing. Well, I certainly do it remember. Was a, Go on. Sorry? Uh, go on. Go ahead. Sorry. No, you go. Well, I'm just thinking that there was, that was the beginning of the kind of, you know, the, uh, music and song and dance and comedy and quizzes and, and that kind of stuff that we, um, uh, we, uh, we incorporated. The, uh, um, uh, Nikki Tilro was, uh, became Beaver when we did the series of, of Cucumber and, and Nikki, uh, 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 was the mime on today's special later on. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, you find exceptional talents and you try to, you try to work with them through your career. Yeah. You know, I remember the one thing I remember from Cucumber was that, and I would have just known it in reruns, um, but would have been, uh, you were able to be part of the Cucumber Club and you could send away to TV Ontario and you could get a badge and a certificate. And, uh, you know, it's interesting how we've come full circle because um, you know, I just see in the last five or six years, again, a real big emphasis on taking care of the environment. And, uh, you know, 25, 30 years ago, you, you were pioneering the same and advocating for the same responsibility that, that students and young people ought to have. Would you, uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of people that worked at TV Ontario in the 70s, and a lot of them regarded that there was a family atmosphere amongst the production crew and staff. Did you sense that, and was that your experience? And was there a lot of common overlap in terms of personnel that you worked with on different shows? I, um, um, uh, I mean, a lot of people at TV Ontario. TV Ontario was a was a staff uh, place, and uh, uh, you. One of the things that so you needed to use a staff that was there, and I fought like crazy to work with the very best people. Uh, and we'd work over and over again. There were, um, there were, you know, five women that I worked with for, you know, for, for over 15 years there who were, uh, just so exceptional, so hardworking, so talented, so smart and so loyal, you know, um, it took, you know, we worked phenomenally hard. And, uh, so you, uh, you wanted to have, you wanted to choose people to you know that you could work with day in and day out sometimes 16 hours a day so uh, uh, they were pr they were pretty special and we were we were lucky because we got so many wonderful creative opportunities at TV Ontario I mean that, I think that's one of the things that that I am so grateful for that um, you know you can have you can be as talented as you want and you can have great ideas but to ha to be in an environment where people allowed you to create and uh, you know create to a particular curriculum with a, with particular objectives that came down from you know from my boss Ruth Vernon and the objectives of you know the mandate of TV Ontario. Uh, but but that being said, to to be allowed to do creative work for a public audience. Uh, that you know that you know I adored you know I you know could there be a more important audience than children so so I you know I worked with with Jane Downey and Mar Michelle Maurice and Michiko Yano Shuttleworth and Wendy Jones and especially Marnie Malabar uh, Marnie's in charge of TVO Kids now and it's just you know but it was just that was a phenomenal opportunity to work with exceptional people. Yeah. It sounds like it was a really special time, and it, it's funny to hear you talk about that because the people that I've spoken with that have worked with you have similar comments, and they said that one of the greatest things uh, working for you is that you really added value to them by allowing them to be creative and, and just sharing that creativity. Would it be accurate, in your opinion, to say that TV Ontario was indeed a flagship of quality educational programming in the 70s and 80s? Do you really feel like they were leading? You talked about how the, you guys were really innovative. Do you feel, at least from the public's perspective and from uh, critics around you, that you were a leader in educational programming at the time? 
Yeah, we, we were we were lucky. We we were in Ontario, and Ontario had the, had the you know, the greatest resources, right? So TV Ontario was an important part of the the you know the educational system. Now in in uh, Children's Television Workshop in New York, which is now Sesame Workshop, they were doing phenomenal work at the same time in the United States. But in but in Canada, um, th this was the this was the growth of public enterprise, right? The the expansion of the school system, the expansion of community colleges and universities, the healthcare, roads, you know, all that kind of stuff. And TV Ontario was was part of that. Now we've we've reached uh, you know a a plateau now where you know um, where you know we question whether public we want as much public enterprise in our life uh, but that was a time when there were phenomenal opportunities to uh, uh, to grow to experiment to you know challenge ourselves and uh, and so so being in educational television in Ontario I mean there's no question TV Ontario was the you know is the benchmark of educational television you know I mean it, you know WGBH in Boston TV Ontario uh, Sesame Workshop you know there's 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 you can count them on your hands right of, of, of group were phenomenally influential but what about when access, you think of access Alberta uh, out, out west as well weren't they doing stuff at the time yeah. But if you looked at the budget of Access Alberta in comparison to TV Ontario, so you've got to have a, you've got to have significant critical mass, and and Access. I mean, I don't know it terribly well, but uh, but the other educational broadcasters in the other provincial jurisdictions didn't have the kind of money to do the kind of formative research that we did mm -hmm. didn't have the technology to do the quality of programming that we did didn't have the budgets to do uh... what we were doing i'm sure did terrific work but but i think if you look across the spectrum and you uh... that it was tv ontario um, I mean, Quebec did uh, did some uh, uh, good work as uh, as well but uh... uh... you know there was a time when tv ontario was uh... Was truly a world leader in educational program. Now you had mentioned uh, simultaneously uh, stuff that was going on with the Children's Television Network down in the states. Was there, in terms of people that you worked with, um, even actors and puppeteers, or even yourself as a producer, was there a any cross pollination in the sense of having fellow colleagues bouncing off ideas, having connections, friendships with those that, or were, were there two separate entities that just happened to be doing this similar things at the same time? Uh, uh, no, there was cross pollination. Um, I um, one of the things that I tried to do is I tried to learn from the best. I tried to work with the best, and I tried to learn from the best. And I had some wonderful opportunities. The uh, the head of research at uh, at uh, TV Ontario had you know was was connected to both the Ontario Institute for Studies in, in Education, Boise in Toronto, and also. Uh, knew a lot of the researchers, the formative researchers at uh, Children's Television Workshop in New York. I also, uh, I worked, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, I did 200 segments of Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. So I worked for CBC uh, Sesame Street. Uh, so the executive producer and the leader of that, you know, all of your, all of your scripts, you would write your scripts. You'd see the curriculum from New York, which was a vast document. And so you'd see what what they were doing, or I would see because I got to work with it. And I'd have to. I wrote scripts and produced things for uh, Sesame Street uh, using the using the curriculum of of uh, New York. And the, when you did the scripts, the scripts then went to Montreal for the Canadian uh, 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 Board of uh, Advisors, and then went to New York for approval for the scripts before you could produce anything. Right. So that so that. I mean, in terms of cross pollination, that was an opportunity to. Uh, uh, f I, I mean, I worked in kind of both worlds, and I and I was able to um, uh, take advantage of the knowledge of all these people. I mean, I, I also um, I, before I started today's special, I went I went to New York. I, I, I talked to the people at the Children's Television Workshops, heads of research. I talked to. I talked to uh, the pr executive producer of Captain Kangaroo. I talked to the people at at Mr. Rogers. I talked, 
you know, uh, I talked to, you know, some people at, uh, at uh, WGBH in Boston. And so that was part of the research that we did in order to try to take the best from all opportunities and, uh, and, and, then, create some, and then create something special. Ever have the chance to meet Jim Henson or shake his hand? Yes, I did, yeah. yeah I, wa I watched him. Uh, Jim Henson produced uh, Fraggle Rock in Toronto, and uh, so I watched him. I, you know, a number of the people, uh, uh, Nikki Tilro that I mentioned earlier, Bob Stutt, who plays Mort, who played Mort on, to the, on today's special, uh, uh, they, were, uh, they were puppeteers uh, there. A number of the people that I worked with on CBC Ses Sesame Street when I, when I produced music and, and segments for them, uh, they were uh, they were working on Fraggle Rock, and so um, so I had uh, I had an opportunity to work with them uh, and go to the set, and uh, I watched him create some of his uh, some of his specials up at CF, uh, CFTO as well. So uh, um, I mean, I never uh, I never got to work with him, uh, uh, but uh, I watched him work a lot. Very cool, very cool. One of the other big names at TV Ontario, especially in the seventies. Uh, was uh, Ted Coney Bear, who we lost a couple of years ago, the creator of Polka Dot yeah. Door. Any interaction with Ted in those early days uh, with Polka Dot Door? Um, did you ever work for that show or write for that show? I I, uh, I had a couple of interesting experiences with Polka Dot Door, and 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 Ted was uh, uh, was one of the uh, I think they called them uh, superintendents or assistant superintendents at at OECA when I first went there before it was TV Ontario. So. They, they changed that and people became education supervisors but uh, that was the that was a kind of holdover from education because Ted had come from uh, from education to TV Ontario I, I a couple of memories of, of Ted the um, uh, when I before I went to graduate school or when I was in graduate school I came back to Toronto and I was doing a research essay and I went to I went to OECA over in Bayview Avenue and Ted agreed to inter to allow me to interview him so that uh, I got that essay done, so I got my master's. So I, I appreciated that very much. But uh, there, was, there was a gentleman who was uh, who was producing uh, Polka Dot Door, and he was he was ill, uh, got ill on the Friday before the you know the next week, and uh, so they asked me if I'd direct some uh, some segments. Uh, and the way Polka Dot Door worked, I think that we you rehearsed. Uh, five shows Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning, and then shot five shows Wednesday afternoon, Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, Friday morning, Friday afternoon. So I didn't have very much time to work on scripts, but I was a I was a pretty good director. Uh, so I went in and uh, was directing the uh, uh, directing them, and I, re I remember one one time it was a it was a really poignant moment. I was there was a song that they were doing on Polka Dot Door, and I was directing, and I had. I had blocked the cameras similar, similar to the way I would have blocked them for today's special, where there were wide shots and close-ups and camera moves and all that kind of stuff. And when when a performer turns to catch the turn on camera three and then cut the camera one and then do all that kind of stuff, and Ted took me aside and he said, "You know, on this particular show, we we want children at home to be able to." Do the same thing that the children, uh, that the performer on the screen is doing, and he said, "You know, it's our preference, or it's my preference, that you just lock off a wide shot on the performer, so that there aren't distractions for the child at home." And and uh, and and I did. He was he. It was his show, and it was his vision, and and whatever. But it was it was a wonderful learning experience for me because you know there is a time where you think you're pretty hip and cool, and you can, you know, the faster you cut the cameras, the uh, the, the 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 smarter and hipper you are. And it was a, it was a wonderful moment to remind me that there are different there are different reasons to cut cameras. And there are reasons not to cut cameras, and you know th those of you, you know, uh, you being a fine musician would understand that. You know, it's not just the number of notes you put in; it's sometimes the rests and the and the breathing opportunity. And in painting, it's not how much paint you put on the canvas, but where you direct the eye and and when it's finished. And so, so 
you know, there were there were always lessons to learn. As I uh, you know, there there always are in life. But uh, but uh, Ted taught me that lesson. And I appreciated that. Interesting too that two of the the hosts for Polka Dot Door during during that time, Nina Kio and Noreen Virgin, you would later hire for today's special. And uh, it's interesting to see that they they were involved in Polka Dot Door as well. Um, as we just kind of wrap up uh, talking about these early TV Ontario days, what differences do you see in the philosophy of educational programming then and now? How has the quality and effectiveness of educational programming progressed? I don't think it's progressed at all, and it's it's one of my great disappointments. Um, uh, uh, we've lost the public uh, will to do educational programming. We do public programming, and we do... Um, uh, but the way that uh, TV Ontario hasn't been funded adequately and, and uh, Sesame Workshop hasn't been funded adequately and so we really haven't built on the original promise of, in my view, of educational programming that was around in the 1970s. There hasn't been a better program produced than Sesame Street. There hasn't been a better uh, educational program produced then read along and read all about it mm -hmm. uh, since the, the you know the early 70s uh, so or the late 70s perhaps and it's uh, it's kind of a shame we changed the we changed our our model of broadcasting from a, an educational model to an industrial model or from a public model to an industrial model so you know public television PBS in the States, CBC in Canada, educational television like TVO has never been allowed to realize its potential because it's been cash starved. Mm. And it's a, it's a shame because I think there's a fun, still a phenomenal opportunity there. And whether it's television or whether it's online or whether it's, you know, it's video games or whether it's whatever, um, we haven't... Uh, we've just scratched the surface of the potential of educational television or educational media. Mm. As we shift gears now um, and start talking about today's special, I am so excited about this component of the interview only because when we <laughs> sat down for coffee uh, a couple of months ago and you were so gracious to spend so much time with me. When I asked you this question, I was blown out of the water in terms of, of the genesis of today's special. And I think those viewing will be very surprised. Yet at the same time, having you given the explanation, um, it made complete sense. And I do hope that you can go into the same detail that you did. Bring us back to the genesis of today's special. Where and when did you come up with this idea for the premise of this show? The... Uh I mean, it really happened because of um, uh, an opportunity presented to TV Ontario by Rogers Broadcasting. Rogers Broadcasting is a is a it's a mammoth cable and uh, you know television stations and radio stations and uh, they do all sorts of things right now. But this was a fledgling organization that Ted Rogers had organized, and basically, you know, most television in the early uh, in the 70s was over the air broadcasting with antennas. This idea of cable television uh, was relatively new. There was no such thing as satellite television. There were, there were no specialty channels. There were n none of this kind of stuff. Everything was over the air. So in order for cable television to get traction, they had to offer things that, that regular over the air broadcasters didn't offer. And so uh, Rogers, Rogers Television, Rogers Cable, went to TV Ontario and said, we'd like to partner with you. We'd like you to bundle together a bunch of children's programs uh, and put them in a package that we can play exclusively on, on uh, Rogers Cable. And they came up with, a, the name was Galaxy at the time. And what they did is they gave TV Ontario uh, money to repackage existing shows, you know, Cucumber and Math Patrol and Math Makers and Read Along and Read All About It and Polka Dot Door and that, those kind of shows, Dear Aunt Agnes, I think, Heather Conkey's show. And then there was a bunch of money 
uh, for original French programming and original English programming. So uh, uh, my boss's boss, Alpha Zan, uh, uh, had a meeting with, with uh, my boss, Ruth Vernon, and myself, and he said, Clive, I'd like you to kind of look at this money that we've got, and I think it was a significant amount of money over a number of years. It was a, I think it was a million three or something like that, million two, which was a lot of money at that, at that time. It seems like peanuts in broadcasting these days, but it's, it was a lot of money. And so Al wanted me to, to come up with a kind of idea for five or six shows that would be good for TV Ontario. And uh, I, uh, I went away and did some, did some thinking about it, and I said, I, I have a different proposal for you. I'd like to do one blockbuster show. I'd like to take, you know, the money. Now, remember, this was, this was probably $1.2 million over five years or something like that. And I said, I'd really like to take it, rather than do five shows, I'd like to take that money and create one show and do a block of programs for that show and that would really have a, you know, a, a, a significant impact in the marketplace. Because it's one of the problems that we had at TV Ontario. You know, you did six shows or eight shows or nine shows or something like that, and then they're over, right? But if you want to have a, if you want to have an impact in a marketplace, you want to have a show that uh, that's going to be on regularly. And so my proposal was that we spend that money, do 40 shows, and uh, you can be sure that Alpha Zan had fallen on the floor by this time. You know, he thought, "What has this man has lost his mind?" And I, and because no one had ever produced 40 shows before at TV Ontario. So I propose that we, we do it, we shoot, all, we shoot the shows, we go to air when we have 40 shows complete. And rather than doing, and I wanted to strip the shows. I wanted to have them, you know, uh, often so that children would be able to find them in, you know, it wasn't a, bro it wasn't a complicated broadcast uh, environment at that time like it is now, but there were... Uh, TV Ontario had trouble getting an audience. So I, I said Tuesdays and Thursdays, if we did them Tuesdays and Thursdays, we, and we did 20 shows, we'd have we'd, 40 shows, we'd have 20 weeks of original programming, which would create the sense that, you know, there was just an unlimited amount of programming. And, uh, and uh, uh, again, Ruth Vernon, uh, I, I think what, what they said is, you know, uh, we'll call your bluff, you know, and, uh, and here's so, so uh, we want you to do a pilot for the show. And so that was what I was tasked with to do, uh, uh, to do a pilot. Now what we're talking about, we're not talking about today's special here, we're talking about a pilot for a new preschool program, right? So, you know, uh, it was just kind of, it was an intellectual idea. It was, you know, um, uh, but I was allowed to develop, uh, you know, a research package to look at what kind of program would be most valuable to the market, what program would complement existing TV Ontario programs, you know, and, and again, I had this kind of scheduling uh, proposition that was, you know, it's, it's not new to anybody today. And it, might, it certainly wouldn't have been new to people at, at NBC or, or whatever, but it was, brand, it was a brand new concept at TV Ontario. Because TV Ontario had you know, a fixed amount of money every year, and so they divvied it up to different producers. And then the next year, there might be more money, and you'd, do it, you'd start again. And I wanted to do something that was much more, uh, much more powerful, that really took advantage of, of the medium, and so you know that was that was the kind of that was the gen that was the economic genesis of the of the show. I went away and with the formative research department at uh, TV Ontario, uh, you know, kind of looked at all the television shows that were out there. Looked at the um, uh, 
as much research as I possibly could, went to New York, went to uh, uh, Montreal, talked to people. Um, uh, I was at a conference to talk to people at the BBC, you know, so to try to, to, try to bring all the best ideas around and, and look at the general, look at the, the, the landscape that children were growing up in now. Because this was a different landscape, you know, that the idea of, of uh, uh, working parents, two working parents, the idea of single mothers, the idea of immigration, the idea of different languages, the idea of different cultures. You know, this, the, the late 70s and 80s, that our, our society was changing dramatically and the television programs that were available to children didn't reflect that. Sesame Street did, you know. Uh, shows out of New York uh, did with Children's Television Workshop because they were doing essentially the same thing that, that, that I was doing uh, looking at that. So, so I did that research and, um, and came up with a, a research document that I pitched to Ruth Vernon. And I said, this is the kind of show that I'm thinking of. And what I'd like to do, and then she said, "Well, we need to see. We need a pilot." So she funded. Uh, she funded a pilot. Now, what I realized was that you know, I mean, part of this is a is a dance. You know, you got to make money, and you've got to make it pay off, right? And and this show was phenomenally more expensive than most shows that TV Ontario did. So. Uh, and the beginning of a new show, particularly if you want to do, you know, an opening animation sequence or do music or do something like that, it be, it's pretty expensive. So, uh, so I came up with a brilliant idea of doing two pilots uh, because I thought at least I'd get two half hours, you know, you know, to to do the opening theme, to do the opening, you know, uh, sequence through the through the store and that kind of stuff. It was it was time consuming. It was expensive. So by doing two, the second one was like sixty percent of the cost of the first one because I was able to amortize some of the costs. And so, so you know, if you you know, when people ask why did you do two pilots, there I mean there were I mean there were a couple reasons. One, we wanted to uh, I wanted to test out some things in the show, and a half hour show wasn't enough time for me to test out some of the some of the concept ideas that we that we had and and I was also trying to you know make it somewhat more palatable economically for my bosses yeah. that makes sense totally makes sense it just sounds like you were being a good businessman with what was given to you um, let's uh, well, you, help me that's part that's part of the deal you know mm -hmm. the uh, uh, we think of we think of media and or education as being this thing that's that's separated from from business but you know, you're 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 working with a public purse here, That's right. and it's a tremendous. There's a tremendous responsibility here, and one of the things one of the things that we were able to do with TV at TV Ontario with today's special, is is shoot it, conceive it, and shoot it in a way that was that was totally different than the way they'd shoot they'd shot in any they had shot any other show. And uh, and that created efficiencies where you know the all the money that went into the show or showed up on the screen, and that was and that's the challenge that you have in a public institution, right? In a private in a private institution, if you're a producer and you can do it for you know sixty percent less or ten percent less and whatever and pocket money, that's great. At a public institution, you can't pocket the money. What you do is you, you take the money and you try to get the, the greatest impact you possibly can from the money and that was and so so the business or the strategies that we used to produce were designed to make be the most efficient use of public money. Now if we were to put some years on this, you talked about the initial, you know, Rogers comes, they have this galaxy cable, this package idea. What year around what year do you think that was? How many years of research were done? And to the time, and what year do you think that you were actually shooting the pilots, Hats and Snow? I think we did the pilots in '79, uh, which which would mean that, and because because 
governmental money comes in within a year, it, you know, I would have done six months of, I think I did six months of research before we did the pilots and we did the pilots in, in January and, and uh, February uh, uh, and delivered them, I, I believe, by March 31st. That was the magic, that was the magic number at TV Ontario because it was a, a crown corporation that had to close its books on March 31st. So. So shows had to be in by a particular time, and I think that was that's probably true. Now, this, so one of the reasons why there's snow, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> now, now this is the real fascinating thing, and you just explained this so beautifully to me when we met in person. But walk us through. You talked a little bit um, about the the culture at the time and, and how culture had progressed, and how the characters and the relationships of the characters in in today's special reflect what was happening in the culture and, and the nuclear family at the time. Uh, go, go through that and just explain that to us. And, uh, and in addition, um, tell us about how you found uh, the, the talent for the show and where that came from. But first, tell us a little bit about um, just, the, just how the show was really research-based. Like that just blew my mind when we met this summer, just how research-based it was and uh, just the outworkings of that. We, um, uh, today's special was, um, was going to have a cognitive component in it with quizzes. I wanted to be able to do, uh, uh, to, you know, to do pre-tests and post-tests to see whether children could learn from, from uh, television. There, there hadn't been any definitive uh, research on that, you know. There was lots of anecdotal stuff that they could learn and that kind of stuff, but, but we wanted to do pre-tests and post-tests of whether, whether children could actually learn certain concepts. So there were, you know, so so I, I thought of the show in terms of suits, like you know, spades, clubs, you know, diamonds, hearts, that kind of stuff. And so one of it was cognitive with the quizzes. One of it was cultural and artistic. We um, one of the television can't do everything, and and uh, and some things you know you really want teachers to do and parents to do and whatever. But but one thing television can do is bring performance to uh, to children because you know a, high, a public school teacher can't can't utilize all the technology and all the skills and all the talent base mm -hmm. of everybody out there so so I wanted to bring dance art and music to preschool children and I wanted to bring qual high quality dance, art, and music. Mm -hmm. I wanted to bring high quality uh, scripts and visualization. So beautiful sets, beautiful costumes, beautiful whatever. I did, this was, I mean, you know, it's partly my philosophy, but I didn't want B material. You know, I wanted A material. And that was, and you know, again, Ruth Vernon, she wouldn't accept anything but the best for children. She was a, she was a, you know, a, a wonderful advocate of of, uh, of children. So we did uh, we did those things. Uh, you know, th this was a it was a different generation. So I was looking for. We had old and young. We had uh, we had different cultures. You know, uh, we created so so. Muffy is not only a little character. Muffy was a young character. Sam was deliberately old because we wanted to include multi-generational families. People, you know, in the 70s and 80s were living longer, you know, so that uh, so there were older there were older people around. Sometimes children were uh, were in environments where they were taken care of by grandchildren, grandparents, right? So so uh, so Sam's age and Muffy's age, Sam's maturity. And Muffy's precociousness were carefully designed qualities. Uh, Jeff, as the mannequin, one of the reasons he's a mannequin is he's a tabula rasa, and now that's that's uh, meaning blank slate, so that so that Jeff could learn like the child at home could learn, and because he was a mannequin, he wasn't just a dumb adult. Who didn't know anything? He was a mannequin who didn't have who didn't have you know like the like the uh, uh, the characters in the Wizard of Oz I suppose you know the uh, the the uh, uh, who who you know who had to be taught by Dorothy. Right, you know, Scarecrow. Yeah. Jody was the teacher. Jody was the uh, the 
woman who was working. Jody was the strong mother character. Jody was the example for young women to, to be able to do anything they wanted to do. Jeff was the, Jeff was the, the uh, person who was curious and interested in all the things. The whole group of them were a family, a diverse family, a different kind of family, uh, but a family who cared desperately about each other and protected one another and loved one another. Jody was black. Jeff was white. Sam was a variety of colors and muffy. You know, so, so all that contrast again was to show the richness, the diversity, the the how a world can be different, how you can get along with different people, how different people can learn to cooperate, to work together, to support one another. And a lot of and this, you know, I mean, it, sorry, go on. I, no, go ahead. I was going to say a lot of this. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Was a result of your research that you did to include a lot of this. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, there were there were no shows like this. You know that. Uh, 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 there were no shows with uh, with high quality performance uh, for uh, for uh, young children. There were uh, uh, there were shows. I mean, Mr. Rogers, you know, had a, was a terrific singer and good songwriter, and and he had a terrific piano player. But but we had we had bigger you know bigger bands. We had. Uh, uh, we brought in the best performers, the best studio musicians. You know, the Canadian Brass, Karen Kane, Oscar Peterson, Bruce Coburn. You know, so it was designed to to show young children the you know the finest work that we could give them, and also the silliest jokes and and all you know and all that that kind of stuff too. So you know, it was a it was a it was a, a complex, rich, interwoven uh, uh, tapestry, but the idea of, I mean, the idea of Jeff being a phenomenal dancer, a phenomenal singer, it's, it's, you know, we didn't just hire him just because he was another guy. I wanted the best in the country to show children what beautiful dance was, what beautiful singing was. You know, I wanted the I wanted the richness that Noreen could bring to the camera to talk directly to the children to to be a role model for them. You know, I, I, you know, one of the interesting things of, of today's special when we did it, you know, computers were just brand new. You know, I tried to do research on computers, and there was there was a computer in the beaches in Toronto. There was a computer in a in a library in Oakville. And there was one other computer that we could find. You know, so I mean, it seems like nothing now. But the reason there's a computer in Sam's in Sam's office was that we wanted, you know, we wanted to introduce this idea of you know of working with computers and embracing new technology and and this was. You know, this was something again that we looked at in the research and said, "This is something that's coming along, and we want we want to take advantage of that uh, in this show." Now, it's, it does seem a little odd that there, you can't find a computer anywhere, but uh, that's the time it was. Now, I know the pilots hats and snow. I read uh, some newspaper clippings that said that you actually there was a time when you played these to test them. You played these for preschoolers and you tested when they were engaged with the show. Is it, do I understand that correctly? And could you tell me a little bit about how those pilots were used to actually test with the children? Yeah. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I learned early on is that uh, research is a really powerful uh, uh, part of a television show. Many producers don't like research because research can tell you you're not very good. You know, your show is not very good. Uh, the advantage of research is if you t take advantage of it and you exploit it and you and you learn from it, is that you know you learn you know that your show is going to be successful if you research it carefully. So we took the two pilots for today's special hats and so and played them for young children. 
And what we did is we, we, we selected young children uh, to watch hats and to watch snow. And we normally put two children in a room together. And we watched them with, we videotaped them and watched them behind uh, two-way uh, or one-way mirrors, right? Mm -hmm. So we had researchers on one side watching the children. The children had the option of playing with toys or watching the television set. And there were lots of toys there and that kind of stuff. And, and, here's, and here's why we did it. I wanted the researchers, and the researchers tabulated when the children laughed when the children watched the television set, when the children turned away from the television set, and then we also had this visual reference of what they were, you know, what, you know, whether they appeared to be interested in it. But one of the things you know in educational television is if a child isn't watching the television or turns away from the television or doesn't appear to be paying any attention to it, there's no chance that you're going to be able to teach them anything. Right? So the first thing you, you, know, you need to do is you need to have their, their attention. Mm -hmm. And if the show doesn't create attention for them, then there's no chance for them to learn. So, so at the end of the show, at the end of this research, I would have a graph of uh, every seven seconds whether children were watching the screen, whether they were playing with toys. And so you, you, you develop a you know, you develop a, a graph that goes up and up and down, and uh, and you can relate it back exactly to, oh, this is where we did the quiz, or this is where Jeff did a dance, or this is where Jody talked direct to camera, or this is where Sam was in the computer room. And so we learned by that, you know, what items children would watch. Now, there were lots of, you know, and you go in with all sorts of expectations, you know, I mean, television. This 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 is not uh, this is not a, a new idea. Television producers have egos. <laughs> television producers want the show to be enormously successful. Right. Television producers don't like it when their audience, you know, doesn't watch the show. But smart television producers look at this research and then say, "What what do I learn from this research? How do I need to modify the show?" to make even better use of public, uh, public money, to make the show even more important. Now, that's not to say that you want 100% attention all the time, because you know, in a half hour show, you need to breathe and you need to whatever. So we, we, we put that into the show. But we learned, there were a couple of really interesting things that we learned, Travis. We learned, the, the expectation was when Jeff danced, it was going to be like the, you know, forcing culture down kids' throats. And, and now, it was a wonderful production number that he danced, but the attention to what he was doing was phenomenal, you know? Mm. So those ratings were much higher. And you understand, therefore, you know, I mean, lots of people would be able to say to me, you know, kids aren't going to watch dancing on television. Don't even try to do that. That's a, you know, that's a waste of time, a waste of money. Mm -hmm. Well, I have, you know, I have definitive proof mm -hmm. based on the research that we did that children would watch. Now, it was Jeff Hislop for crying out loud, and he was brilliant. And, and we did, you know, stop motion uh, uh, toys in the background with him. It was a beautiful production number, but it was you know, it was Jeff and dancing. And so, and so I was absolutely assured that I could be successful in bringing cultural uh, uh, experiences to young children that they'd never see anywhere else except on today's special or, I mean, other shows like that. But, but that, was, that was something unique in the marketplace. The other thing that we learned, and it was a, it was a really interesting thing for me, the... Uh, when I played the pilots for uh, the executives at TV Ontario, before the research, the final research was done, they, uh, they loved the pilots. They thought it was great. I, so I, I recognized how brilliant they were. <laughs> but, they, uh, uh, but the part that they liked the best was a segment with Sam Crenshaw, wonderful performer, Bobby Dermer. He's just a great actor. And there was a lot of, lot of comedy with, with wordplay and that kind of stuff. 
Well, kids, the you know the ratings went way down there. Kids didn't understand the word play. They didn't get the humor. They you know so it was so you know so I I said oh now that's surprising. I thought the kids would find that very funny, and I thought that they would find Jeff's dance hard to take, but. You know, I was prepared to force them to watch the dance, you know. And it was, it was interesting, when, when Bob Dermer heard about the research, he said, well, maybe there's something I can do with my character, because every performer wants to keep the job and, and whatever. I said, well, you know, don't worry. I know you're a great performer. What I know now is that certain types of verbal humor is inappropriate for a preschool market. So what I, what we... We started, and, and because young children tend to be a little more reticent to relate to older characters, you know, and Sam was the older character and had the mustache and, and whatever, you know, so I learned, you know, if, of the four characters, Sam was the one that was liked least. And, uh, but part of philosophy of the show was, I wanted this multi-generational, multi, you know. Mm -hmm. So what we did from the pilots to the series is we made Sam more physical. We created more physical rather than verbal comedy with him. And so that's the genesis of when the computer, when Sam pushed the buttons on the computer and everything went wrong and things fell from the ceiling and fell, came in from the side and that kind of stuff, that was designed to give Sam uh, a funny, you know, physical comedy relief so that I would then be able to exploit his, his history, his, you know, the fact that he was an authority figure, the fact that he would take care of Muffy, the fact that he was the friend of Jody, the fact that he could be a teacher to Jeff, all those kinds of things. So, so that research was invaluable for us to uh, to uh, to massage the sh the show in in ways and to and also to say well okay we know this works I'm not going to worry about this one anymore and and frankly for political reasons too it is I would say we have an, this is not me saying that that this that this thing's going to work. Uh, because, as you know, producers think everything they think is brilliant. Uh, my view, my view was, I want, I want children to be able to uh, benefit from this show. That's my job as a producer. I'm trusted with a whole bunch of money and an opportunity uh, from my boss to to do this and and you know you also have a responsibility to all those performers to create characters that can be successful and so that's and so that's you know what we tried to do and that was one of the reasons why why today's special was so successful one of the because Every year we researched something more. We did more at the pilots than anything else. But every year we were researching something more so that we could learn how children react to television. So we could make sure that our message got across, that they would understand what we're talking about. Because, you know, to go back to that comment about, you know, Ted Coney Bear suggesting to me to leave the wide shot in a particular thing for a dance was fine for polka dot door it wasn't what we were doing in today's special but we didn't do it in today's special because i thought it was cool we did it because that was you know that was an effective way of communicating the the curriculum that we had in the show so we have this premise of a mannequin that lives in a department store coming to life at night, which is just brilliant when you think of how that engages young people. Just a brilliant idea. And I know that you've said that a lot of this is research-based, but uh, I, I don't know you very well, but I've met you once, and I've known you enough to know that you're probably more modest than you ought to be. And tell us a little bit from your collective past where that idea came from, because I know that it, w it was... 
it came, part of it came out of the research, but I know that there are collective things in your past that just that you brought to the table when you were creating the show. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, I, I you know, the, the the thing about uh, there's something called a you know a synapse, and you what you try to do is uh, you know you can do as much research as you as you want. It doesn't create a television program for you, right? And at some point, you have to say, well, who are these characters, and what's going to happen in the show, and how is this going to be tied together, and why is this different, and all that kind of stuff. And and you know what? Uh, uh, if you can explain those creative synapses to me, I would, you know, I would love, you know, you just tell me and tell me where to go on YouTube and I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll learn that. I mean, I've, I've spent my life, I've spent my life trying to make connections between uh, curricular goals, intellectual objectives, and, and the heart and laughing and crying and and whatever and that's what creative people that's what creative people do and so in the uh, I mean I was very fortunate I worked uh, uh, I worked very closely in the pilot stage with Joanne Hauser and Clive Endersby the two writers uh, Joanne wrote uh, uh, Hats and Clive wrote Snow I think and uh, see, I can't even remember. They were we were we were such a team, and so you know, you know, where does the genesis of Jeff come and that kind of stuff? Well, I know the name Jeff. I mean, I saw him doing a super special for CBC, and I said that's the guy I want for the show. And it was just it was you know it was total chutzpah on my part to to think that a guy who had you know, danced with the Bolshoi and had his own, you know, his own super special and was in great demand in musical theater that he would work on a children's program. But it turns out that he had a sensibility and a sensitivity that was just, that was phenomenal. And today's special was wonderful for him. Um, I knew that I wanted to balance him off uh, with a, you know, with another character. And so, you know, it, so we came up with, with, with Jody for all the all those reasons, but but you know I I saw Noreen do Polka Dot Door once, and I I just snuck in the back of of the the the, the thing and uh, uh, and so so many of the ca the characters bring a lot of their own stuff. I mean I had all the you know I had lists and lists of what this character was going to do, but Noreen brought uh, sensibility to it, and I, I I don't know if I told you I told you the story before, but I remember sitting in the back of Polka Dot Door watching her perform, and there was there was her talking directly to the camera, and you could just grab the kind of beam of intensity between her eyes and the camera. You could just see something very special there, you know. And I knew that she had, you know, that she had something, uh, something special. So that, you know, and then the, then the, the, you know, trying to distill all of this stuff. I mean, you know, the the title to be special. We had all sorts of working, working things, you know. And there was one day I was thinking, oh, I've got to come up with a name for the show because, you know, because, you know, you've got to write it on. You don't want to do. Uh, preschool program named TBA on the thing, you know, and I just, I, you know, one night I, uh, I don't know whether I, I was walking or I saw, uh, saw a sign in a, in a restaurant, today's special, and then I thought, well, what a wonderful, you know, what a wonderful philo philosophical point of view. I mean, it's, it's both Today's special because we were going to theme it. So today's special is hats. Today's special is right. snow. Today's special is, is whatever was phenomenal. But also the idea that today is special, right. you know, which kind of, which kind of, you know, encapsulates my philosophy of life. Uh, I just thought was was a kind of, uh, was a real gift. And you know, now listen. There's lots of times you think you've come up with something brilliant. And then the next morning, it's not so brilliant, and Absolutely. so you just kind of you just kind of let it slip sometimes, you know. But you say it with positivity, like you know, 
oh, here's the name of the show. You don't ask people whether you think it's a good idea, you know, and then you just see whether it kind of sticks. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things that was just, I mean, I knew right from the top that this was, you know, it was a dynamite title and it was, uh, and it, and it stuck. So, so, so there were so many of those kinds of things, you know, that, uh, I mean, I remember in the snow, uh, the pilots for snow and we shot at the, uh, uh, we were out, you know, Sam on a toboggan. And of course, you know, is Bobby Dermer's at the bottom of the toboggan, the cameraman's on another toboggan going down a hill. There's, there's been no snow at all. I know this is the last day of shooting. I'm in real trouble. There's a snow, snow comes in overnight. And I say, oh, isn't that wonderful? We can go out and shoot salmon to the bog and, and do some exterior snow stuff. Well, if, a, if the biggest blizzard of the winter didn't happen that particular day, you know, and I know we're, we're way out of town and the crew's got to get back to town and I'm thinking, you know, just one more shot, just one more shot, you know. And, uh, so, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, you know, there is a, when everything is, working on all cylinders when you have brilliant writers and brilliant performers mm -hmm. when crew desperately cares about the show mm -hmm. when you see when people people start to you know people are quick to recognize quality everybody wants to do good work and 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 we had that kind of magical environment of brilliant performers you know, wonderful production team, great writers, you know, it just all came together and uh, it, was, it was a true gift, a true gift. You mentioned some of the working titles for the show. Do you remember any of the working titles that never made the cut off the top of your head? Not for that, not for today's special, no. I, <laughs> I remember we, uh, uh, I did a show called McCabe Mysteries uh -huh. uh, and uh, later on and, and uh, and I had proposed it as as um, junior, meaning grades four to six, junior mystery show, you know. And I thought, well, that's just stupid, you know. That you can't, you know, that no nobody's going to budget for something like that. So I went, and all the all the program submissions were in. And it was a great great idea, and 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 whatever. And I pulled the submission back, and I said, you got to think of a better thing. And so so I called it Mystery at Eagle Lookout. You know, just just a kind of you know, so people could grab on to something, right. you know, and right. uh, yeah. You know. So, so so you have these you have these four characters. You have a mannequin. You have a, an African American woman. You have, or I should say, African Canadian woman to be to be politically correct. You have uh, you have an older uh, character. Where does this mouse come from that you created? Where did the idea for a mouse come from? Why a mouse? Uh, uh, well, part of the Okay, um, whether it's a mouse, I wanted I wanted a small puppet as opposed to a bigger puppet. I wanted I uh, Muffy is the child, right? Right. Muffy is the is the impetuous, uh, curious child that counterbalances Jeff as the you know tabula rasa. So the so the you know the the opportunity to get into a little bit of trouble you know some uh, a character that's 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 quick with the wit that is uh, that's fast that moves around that does um, you know so so that was you know again contrast but but of course muffy talked in rhyme right so what we wanted to do that was part of our language curriculum so we wanted we wanted a character you know that would that would be uh, certainly be different, but we wanted the we wanted to not only be uh, have the eyes stimulated by dance and whatever, and the ears stimulated by music, but the but the language skills of young children to hear rhyme, to hear rhythm, to hear, and so that was you know I mean you know it was a very particular curricular idea. That had to be executed brilliantly, uh, brilliantly. Oh, listen to me. Had to be executed with with great care uh, to and, and and to make it seem like that was just a natural thing. 
you know, because like like your question, um, the you know there is no such thing as a, as a, like a rhyming mouse, right? But it was uh, um, uh, it was something that after a while, after watching it, you just suspend your disbelief. You just think, well, you know, because it works. It worked within the show. Now that's you know that's a tribute to the writers. And certainly a tribute to Nina Keo, who is just you know just a brilliant performer. You know. Well, let's talk. So a little I, bit, let's talk I, a little bit about the the casting process. You know, you mentioned uh, where you had first saw Jeff and uh, Noreen, but of course there was Bob Stutt, Nikki Tilrow, Nina, and and Bob Dermer. How did you bring us into the casting process? And and was the casting done in early 1979 or late 1978? Did you have the team assembled at that point? Yeah, the '79 um, uh, was. Um, uh, uh, Jeff was Jeff was the first. Um, uh, I, I went after him, and I thought, well, he'd be the he'd be the linchpin. Uh, Bob Dermer, who played uh, who played the Sam, uh, had we had developed the character of Sam in a previous uh, television program called uh, uh, Music Inc. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, the the characters of Sam and Muffy, the uh, the two puppets, were created by. Uh, 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 Noreen Young in Ottawa, and Noreen Young did under the umbrella, um, under the umbrella tree, I think it was called, and, and a number of a uh, number of shows for TV Ontario. She was on Read Along, um, uh, wonderful puppeteer. But Sam Crenshaw was the was the lead character in uh, in Music Inc. with the Canadian Brass. And so I had had that experience with him. So I knew he was a wonderful performer. I knew he was. Uh, uh, I thought the character would work. And so I thought, well, Music Inc. wasn't extended into a series, so we would uh, we would take that character and uh, and add one more puppet. So Noreen Young in Ottawa made uh, uh, made uh, Muffy Mouse. So now it's a surprise. Then I cast Nina Keo. Uh, in it, and of course, Nia Keo is a is a brilliant puppet maker. So it was a little little um, uh, challenging. Poor Nina, you know, being a brilliant puppet maker, having to work with someone else's puppet. But uh, but uh, that's kind of the way it was, you know. Now, Music Inc. You said it never got expanded to a series, but there would have been uh, a pilot or a number of pilots made. And was the same puppet used in today's special for Sam used in Music Inc.? Yes. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. We did. Uh, we didn't get to. We did the pilot, and the pilot was, you know, really successful. Won war awards all over the the world, but but it wasn't what TV Ontario was looking for at the time. So, uh, uh, so yeah. I th now I think uh, we had we had several Muffies, several Sams. Uh, so I think I think uh, Noreen Young did some revisions on on right. Sam, but uh, you know, working from the working from the same cast, right. she molded. Uh, Sam was uh, was a latex uh, uh, puppet, and uh, Muffy was um, you know, the same, but flocked. So. so, so somewhere deep in the vaults of TV Ontario, there is a pilot for a show called Music Inc. that would have had an earlier incarnation of Sam Crenshaw. That's right. Very interesting. Very very interesting. Clive, tell uh oh, me now now you see here's the detective. He starts going off looking for other things. <laughs> I can get myself into trouble here, right? Well, you know, I just think people watching this will be curious to know. You know, that's just a little piece of trivia that the average Today Special person would not know. But isn't that often the case? You know, there'll, there'll be TV series, and there'll be, uh, you know, one will be more popular than another. And, um, you know, you'll have a same puppeteer or same actor, and, and there'll be similarities. Sometimes it's the exact same character, and it's just interesting to, to note that. Clive, tell me about some of your fondest memories working with the core four, Jeff, Noreen, Bob, and Nina. Well, you know, listen. I, I I've learned so much from them. Um, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's uh, it, it's truly fair to say that you know we loved the show. We love. We knew what a great opportunity it was, and we uh, we loved the show. Uh, there are a couple of um, you know a couple of moments I remember, and uh, I mean, one of them is in the is in the shooting the pilot for Snow. In studio, 
Uh, I remember being, you know, the puppets were were higher on the stage, you know, so the puppeteers could be could be below. And I'm I'm I usually directed from a truck, but I directed this part from the uh, uh, from the floor. And uh, there was, uh, uh, I think, Muffy was singing, or the gr the group was singing, and there was snow falling in the studio, uh, and it was. It was truly a magical, truly a magical moment. One of those, one of those moments where you just, you know, you just think, "Oh my gosh, this is such." I am so lucky to be part of this experience, and so, so I think that moment was great. Uh, early in the first season, we uh, we uh, did a live show at Christmas at uh, you know a 40, 40 minute show or so at Christmas at, at Simpsons. They had been helping us because we shot part of the show at, at Simpsons and it was our, but it was our first exposure to a live audience and we had no idea first of all it was a like a Saturday morning thing where you get to see the cast of today's special and you get you know you know orange juice and a Danish or something I can't remember what what it was uh, but it was our first exposure to seeing an audience who had watched you know maybe maybe 10 episodes had been on air by this time probably went on in September and uh, this would have been early December so September October November uh, four months uh, so you know three months so you know, maybe, uh, you know a certain number of shows and the audience the tickets sold out in an hour Wow! and the uh, and and then there was there was a moment there where there was a tender moment we decided to do a number of songs and there was a tender moment between Jody and Jeff singing a song called I have uh, I have you which is on the, the today's special album and the uh, uh, I was worried about it because I thought well here's here's Saturday morning children you know you know hyped up on sugar <laughs> And it was there wasn't a peep in the you know in the show for the forty minutes that was there, mm -hmm. and so again we knew we had something very special there, and you don't know that until you till you test it out in the in the marketplace, and uh, so that and then I think I'm, there's any number of uh, of uh, dance sequences that Jeff did, but uh, there was one at. Uh, uh, we shot at Simpsons at night, you know, uh, for for a number of segments every every series of sequence of shows, and and we just developed a kind of shorthand in terms of the the uh, the work that Jeff would do and the directing and that kind of stuff. And this was one of the things where we'd gone in at nine o'clock at night, and it was six o'clock the next morning, and we had to be out by six because the you know the early morning group would come into the store. And the sun was just coming through uh, a rounded, uh, arched window in Simpsons, and that we were just finishing off a song. And uh, you know, we were going to shoot, you know, in one direction. And I just saw the sun coming up through the arched window, and I said, "Okay, change of plan. This is where it is. We need a big finish here." Jeff knew what the shorthand was. You know, he was there was a there was a box where he could run to the box towards camera do an aerial crossover you know end up in the splits you know right up at the camera and we had wonderful we had some wonderful camera people and some wonderful you know uh, uh, lighting people and it was just one of those moments where you just say well where else do you get to do this you know and uh, uh, Jeff and Oscar Peterson dancing mm -hmm. Noreen doing big production numbers you know it was just there were some uh, there were some great moments in the show. Noreen, Noreen famously refers to that uh, that orange outfit she wears in the opening sequence as her usher's outfit, and uh, this is one of my curious questions. And I know you've since explained it to me, but um, tell us why you know that usher's outfit uh, was retired after the pilots, and it's only in the but yet it remained in the opening credits for you know the rest of the the show's history. The credits were never reshot. What, what was the reason behind that, Clive? Uh, it's uh, let me think. Oh yeah, money. <laughs> it was so expensive. The opening credits were so expensive to shoot that uh, to reshoot them, you know, required both location shooting in um, in Simpsons, 
you know, for, uh, you know, for, it was quite complex. And then, uh, uh, and then a, a, a complicated chroma key sequence. And this was, you know, this was still early chroma key. So, so, you know, to reshoot it, it was probably, you know, 30 or $40,000. And I would have, I always opted for new creative opportunities mm -hmm. rather, rather than that. And poor Noreen, you know, <laughs> over, you know, you think, oh, think over eight years, a guy would have changed his mind, but, you know, then I would have had, then we would have had to go back and, you know, if we did it in the fourth year, we would have wanted to go back and change the opening for the other years and that kind of stuff. So sure, and her so, co her costume ended up evolving. You know, depending one year she has pockets on both on the front. One year it's just one here, and you know the the, <laughs> the fandom out there can tell you what season it is based on her outfit and the the uh, the the makeup of her outfit. Tell us a little bit about the production schedule uh, of how today's special was taped. Was a whole season knocked out in a few months? How much of the year was actually taped? taking up and recording a season or as you refer to it a series we did um, um, uh, we shot the whole sequence the whole show out of uh, out of sequence so we had shoot all the Muffy rooms together for you know the first year we did 40 shows then we did 25 then I think we did 20 then 20 then 20 I, I, I can't even remember how many seasons we did but it was you know I think it was six or seven um, um, we um, if anybody out there can do the math, there was 121 shows, and we did 40 the first year. So figure out the number of other years right. that we that we had, and the um, so we had a schedule. I mean, part of the deal was you know to be to be strategic about economics, and so we would shoot all of the Simpsons things in one week or two weeks at night. Uh, we would do all of Sam's rooms together. We would do all of the mime things together. We would do all of the um, the um, well the main set material together. We would do all yeah. So so it was a question of trying to amortize the cost, get the get the the most efficient use of of a set. So we'd so we'd go in and we'd shoot uh, we'd shoot twenty shows worth of Sam's rooms all at once and so totally out of sequence so you can imagine the continuity issues of what happens when Sam comes in what happens when Sam goes out what appears on the monitor with Sam you know and sometimes we shot them in the studio sometimes we did them in other uh, in other places Muffy's room we always shot at TV Ontario they had a they had a small studio not not a big one but but big enough for Muffy's room and so so again continuity you know you know, it could be in the certainly in the first season. It might have been uh, 12 months between the time Muffy's out in the hallway and then going into her room and trying to get figure out what shoulder the boa was on and what you know what costume she was wearing. Uh, but it was uh, it was much more efficient. So we'd go in, we'd shoot uh, we'd shoot uh, uh, eight scenes from Muffy's room a day, and then the next day another eight scenes, and you know, so we'd. Um, so that was part of the efficiency of the thing. But in the opening, uh, I think it was 18 months, the first 40 shows before the, you know, the first start and the, and the, the final show was delivered. Oh, wow. It's very interesting. So we have this magic date you mentioned before, March 31st, 1979, when the two pilots, Hats and Snow, were delivered to the execs at TV Ontario. How soon after that you, did you... You understand, Travis, that... That uh, some of this is revisionist history, where I'm trying. You're asking me a question, and I was there, and I did it. Uh, but you, but you know, but you know, for the audience, Travis Doucette knows more about this, more about today's special than I do. So, so. You know, let's come clean on well, this, okay? I, I, I don't know about that. We'll be flexible with those dates. We'll be, we'll be flexible okay. with those dates. How soon after, when you delivered those to the execs, were you actually in production for that first, those first 40 episodes? Was it fairly soon after? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It, it was, uh, uh, it, this, was a, this was a show that, um, uh, that uh, I mean, after we did the, I mean, we did the formative research, and then we did some of research on the show, uh, but uh, um, it was it was very clear from both both 
you know, the heart of the executives and the fact that we had the money from Rogers to go ahead, right. uh, uh, we just, um, um, uh, we, you know, we proceeded in a way that was, you know, we just, we just moved ahead quickly. So what we did is that one of the things that we did with the shows is we, because we shot them out of sequence, we, you know, we had the 40 scripts or we, and we started shooting the first 20 shows. Well, you know, you've got 20 shows and you've got, uh, you've got 30 scene, about 30 scenes per show. So you've got, you know, 600, 600 scenes. We'd, you know, I'd strip them all on, on a strip board and then, and then, you know, the challenge for me, you had to do that before you could do some serious budgeting. So we'd get some, we'd get the initial script money and then have to budget the rest of the rest of the series. And so I, I went through the, the 600, you know, strips of the first thing and I think the, uh, the next 600 as well and, you know, had to assign how long it was going to take me to shoot each one of those scenes. And so, you know, you can imagine if you're off by five minutes a scene, you know, five minutes times, you know, in the first 40, uh, uh, 1,200 scenes, you know, you're off by, you're off by weeks. Right. So, uh, uh, so that was part of the job. And I remember, I remember uh, uh, Marnie Malabar banging on my office door saying, Clive, you're going to have to come out sometime. You got to <laughs> give me these trips, you know. And I'm, I'm looking at it thinking, oh, my goodness, you know. Is that a 15-minute scene? Is that a 25-minute scene? Is that a 90-minute scene? Okay, there's chroma key. There's special effects. They got to change the costume. You, you know, and so you, uh, uh, so you eventually, uh, you eventually do that. And that's so. And, and then at, at the end of the sequence, you couldn't, you couldn't edit the show until all those scenes were together. Right. Remember again, this was, this is in the this is in the day and age of linear editing on two-inch videotape. So it's not like you can. It's not like nonlinear editing now, where you just you just throw it into your uh, into your Mac and edit the sequences that you need to do, and then just cut and paste and put things in. You'd have to you you know you couldn't do that. Right. So uh, so titling, timing, all that kind of stuff. You know, you started at the beginning, and then you you know when you got to the end, you. Sometimes you had little whoopsies, you know. It's not twenty minutes and fifty seconds; it's thirty-one minutes. And uh, and uh, why was that? And it was usually, you know, who you know who the problem usually was. Who? This guy right here. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Clive. Clive Andersby, the uh, wonderful writer. You know, he, I, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd said at the end, you know. That well, this this show's a little little long, Clive. You know, you're, we've got to be careful when we write scripts. You know, you know, and and Clive and Clive, he was a real, he was a uh, he was a, he's a wonderful writer, great craftsman. And he went back and looked at the thing, and he said, "Well, Clive, you know, when I wrote this script, I didn't say, you know, twenty eight second dolly at the beginning of the of the scene, you know, and you know." And big, you know, big ending on this thing, you know, that this is, I tied the thing out to this thing and, and you've milked it for this and that, you know, to, <laughs> and, and he was, and he was right, you know, but don't tell Clive Andersby that because I don't want him to, I don't want him to ever hear that he was right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things that us diehard historians have been able to figure out through things like the TV guy that was published through the Toronto Star is that the... The, uh, and, and we know this because there was quite a large article, uh, I don't know if you remember this even as I tell you, because um, I think I've discovered it since, since we last spoke, but there was quite a large article in the Toronto Star's uh, TV guide, I forget how they branded it, um, talking about um, the beginning of today's special. And uh, they actually went to air in the public, according to this TV guide, in September 1982, like you said, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Interesting thing, part of my collective memory was that today's special aired right before Doctor Who, and I think I got into Doctor Who as a kid because I was watching today's special and I would just continue to watch. And I remember always being freaked out because, you know, here's this lovable children's show, and if you remember the opening sequence of Doctor Who from the BBC, just this face coming at you from outer space and that, that horribly horrific music, and then of course the Daleks and all the other scary monsters 
Um, I remember as a kid being both fascinated but scared at the same time, having just watched today's special. But all that to say, um, from what we can tell, uh, began airing to the public in, in 1982. Um, would, would you guys have been in production most of the year before? And, and I also had read that when some of the episodes were actually finished, maybe the first installment of the 20, that there was some shopping around. Um, I, later we find out that it was in syndication with Nickelodeon and with PBS and in many other stations. W was there some shopping around of the show before it actually aired on TV Ontario? Or did, uh, help us understand the chronology of that, or did it gain traction after it was airing on TV Ontario? Well, I think, you know, you need to call uh, Travis Doucette because he's, he knows this a whole lot, whole lot better than me. We, um, uh, we didn't go to air until we had, uh, we didn't have all the shows completed of the 40, but I wanted that sequence again. I wanted, uh, I wanted there to be 40 complete shows so that we got 20 weeks of original of original material. Right. So that's why we delayed until September. And and September, you know, September is the traditional launch of new television programs. Not so much anymore, but was certainly at that time. Uh, September was a time when children went back to school. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, there was there was all that, uh, you know, all that thinking. I mean, the, the, it's interesting, the time slot, you know, we, we didn't think of putting it before Doctor Who, but we did think of putting it after Polka Dot Door. Right. That was part of my strategy, because Polka Dot Door was a very strong show on uh, TV yeah. Ontario. And remember, this was, this was a kind of a psychosocial sh show as opposed to a, a cognitive uh, um, educational show. And so it had a different, it, for a different time slot, a different... Uh, uh, a different purpose at TV Ontario, and uh, and uh, Polka Dot Door had been the show that was the the mainstay at this time, and uh, and I wanted to I wanted to take advantage of the flow through audience from uh, uh, from Polka Dot Door, and I'm guessing that Doctor Who wasn't interested in the flow through audience from today's <laughs> special. Clive, tell us a little bit about the syndication, because it really is remarkable, just where this show, Today's Special, was shown afterwards. And tell us a little bit about how the, the deal with Nickelodeon and PBS was, uh, how that came about, and um, what the benefits of that were. TV Ontario had a very uh, a very strong marketing department at the at the time, and, uh, and uh, many TV Ontario shows, uh, uh, the, the reading shows, the science shows, uh, were phenomenally successful in uh, in the American marketplace. Again, back to our, co our earlier comment, uh, uh, t uh, TV Ontario was a world leader in educational programming and did and did exceptional programs. and And when there are exceptional programs, you know, the whole world is looking for them. Now, that's true in educational programming. It's less true. It's less true in public programming. And it's less true in in sometimes preschool programming, because because every jurisdiction is very protective of their very young children, you know, and they want they want their young children to learn their own sensibilities of the culture and and uh, uh, but having said that, um, um, uh, Jerry Laybourne was the uh, uh, um, second in charge at Nickelodeon at the at the time and she really liked uh, today's special and and I don't think her boss got the show you know but I think Jerry was pretty pretty adamant and uh, and bought today's special for for Nickelodeon now Nickelodeon isn't this at this time isn't this monster that it is today it is phenomenal enterprise owned by Viacom and, and whatever. It was a fledgling cable network in the United States, but I mean there was a time when uh, the number one show on Nickelodeon was uh, you can't do that on television right. out of out of CPOH in Ottawa and then eventually Nickelodeon produced it themselves and the number two program was Today's Special. So uh, and, and that you know it was a, it was a wonderful thing um, because it it gave us credibility in our marketplace, right? It allow, we're always looking for that kind of external validation of of a show, um, 
And so, and boy, when it sells in the United States, it must be really good, you know. So that, uh, so it sold in the states. It gave us real profile in the states. It sold on a number of PBS stations in the states. It sold to ABC in Australia. It sold to a whole a whole bunch of places. And so the the, the sales, um, you know, sales recouped, uh, you know, a uh, million dollars for TV Ontario, which is great. Now the fact that I think I think we sold. I think we spent $3.4 million on the series, which was an awful lot of money for TV Ontario, given that it was totally TV Ontario money. It wasn't, it wasn't shared with anybody else. It, uh, uh, but, you know, it, it repeated forever and, and uh, you know, it was probably, you know, a dollar twenty-two per show by the time it had re uh, aired. But it was, uh, it was, it was a sale of, Nickel to Nickelodeon to PBS to ABC in Australia. It was the first, I think, can, for, I think the first Canadian show to be in the Museum of Broadcasting in New York. And these these are the kinds of things that 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 reflected so well on the courage of TV Ontario to put such vast resources into into a, a children's program. Because you know, think back to those days with Ruth Vernon and Al Fazan, where Ruth, where Al thought he'd be able to get, you know, five series for it and run five, you know, over five years, because that had been the tradition. That's been the way that TV Ontario normally uh, uh, normally worked. So, you know, great credit, great credit to their vision uh, at and their courage at the at the time. You know, you had mentioned before, you know, a lot of how. The money for today's special came about was through this grant from Rogers. Did today's special air on that Galaxy station that you mentioned? Yes, yeah, it, it was did. the it was the flagship show on uh, on that uh, on that station, and and I you know I can't remember. I mean, it was a it was a cable channel, right? And right. and you know we just think of I just think of cable and television as all one thing right. now, you know. But but there were no you know in in Toronto. I mean, now we've got, you know, if you have cable, what are there, you know, the, the, the famous song, you know, 500 channel universe and nothing on. Well, in fact, there's 500 channels and there's tons of stuff on. Uh, but at that time, there were, there were five or six stations in Toronto. You know, uh, five or, there, was, there was no global, there was no city TV, there was no, there were no specialty channels. So there was CBC, CHCH in Hamilton, CFTO. Uh, and the and the uh, three American networks ABC, NBC, CBS, and and if you were lucky, you could get PBS, and that was that was it when TV Ontario was in the marketplace. So when when cable came along, you know somebody saying, well, you know we're going to charge you monthly to get a better signal, and and cable said, well we need to bring you things that you can't get, so you'd be able to get PBS from the states better. But, you know, so there was no YTV, no Nickelodeon, no Treehouse, no Family Channel, no Global, no, you know, so there was City TV at the time. Um, I just, I forgot about that. So, so your options for children's programs, particularly non-commercial children's programs, there was, you know, you could get it for a brief time in the morning on CBC, you could get it for a time in the morning on TBO and plus this you know, four o'clock to to until Doctor Who at seven o'clock. Uh, uh, so this was the the Galaxy thing on Rogers. You could watch children's non-commercial, educational, non-violent children's television, twenty-four-seven, because they kept repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. Now, how did how did it work? Because remember, you when you were recalling this this arrangement with the Galaxy. Uh, the shows were to be exclusive to them. Yet, would they have? Would today's special not have concurrently aired on TVO at the same time? Yeah. So yeah, it was just. It did. it did. It was allowed to. Yeah. No, I not. I you know I can't remember now whether whether Galaxy got it first or whether TVO got it first. Right. What the, uh, and and I don't think you know in, in this day and age we negotiate 
you know, first windows and second windows. That's 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 a that's an incredibly important part of the of any of any commercial transaction. So, you know, a first window might cost you twenty thousand dollars, and a second window would cost you five thousand dollars, and a third window would cost you one thousand dollars for a show. So, so there's a big economic difference in the thing. But but I I, I think. You know, I think at the time it was more just a, a conceptual thing. Cable didn't care whether they had the first run of the thing, and you know, I th I think it was this idea that we we cable was looking f to partner with somebody who was, you know, who was clean, who was pristine, who had done of the educational stuff. So so and, and that's what we all we try to do in our lives, don't we? We're we're always trying to partner with somebody who's better than us. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were interested uh, you know, I'm sure they were interested in the qual in their in their audience and that kind of stuff. But they were interested in selling uh, subscriptions. And this was a way to sell subscriptions and uh, TV and it was a way that uh, you know, certainly it it enhanced my life greatly. You know? Now you mentioned the Today Special record, and uh, I know I, I, I was for years looking for a copy of it. Kind of a hard item to find these days, but I was able to find one on, <laughs> on eBay. Um, being being the fan that I am, but aside from the Today Special record, what other merchandising do you remember being created for the show? We did um, uh, we did the record, and we did puzzles. Uh, that was that was it. There was some talk of. Of dolls and that kind of stuff, but uh, I and there may actually have been a prototype of a Muffy doll, but I don't, uh, I don't think that the um, um, the uh, we did live shows. Uh, we did three live shows: uh, uh, one in Hamilton Place, one at Roy Thompson Hall, and one at the National Art Center. And uh, um, uh, but um, but partly. Many of the shows after today's special that were very successful with merchandising didn't have live people in them. They had uh, they had puppets, they had costume characters, and it became because you know when you're doing a live events, uh, if you have you know a talent as I call it, uh, it's hard to get a talent to do you know every shopping mall and whatever. But if you've got a costume character. Uh, there are lots of actors who are prepared to, you know, dress up in the costume character for, you know, for a, you know, a modest fee. So, uh, um, uh, and, you know, it was one of those times where uh, it, that's what it needed to go to the next stage, to be Barney, to be uh, the Wiggles, to be um, um, Care Bears or, or whatever, you know. You've, you've talked a little bit about the locations of where the series was taped. You talked about how the, there was a studio for Muffy's Place at TV Ontario, um, and you talked about recording in the Simpsons uh, building uh, late in the evening. Um, really quickly, tell us, how did you negotiate with Simpsons to use their facilities, and why not the Eaton Center, because it was across the way or another department store? What, what, was, what was the reasoning behind choosing the Simpsons store? I think the uh, I think Eaton's uh, uh, didn't the Eaton Center didn't exist at the time, uh, if I'm if I'm correct. I'm not sure when it was built, but uh, but uh, uh, the Simpsons store was more modern, uh, and uh, and we just you know I just called them, and the public relations department was happy to have the relationship and. Uh, uh, I don't think Simpsons knew what they were getting into with the crew going in in the middle of the night, you know, because it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty desolate store at uh, at night. And uh, but it was, you know, it was educational television and public television. We treated them very well, and we uh, uh, we were honest and generous and uh, whatever. It didn't cost anything to go there, uh, except we paid for their security uh, at. You know, a security guard to to make sure that we were okay. But you know, when I was when I was there at night, you know, for scouting locations, you know, I just had the I had the run of the store at night. So so you know, the same kind of you know phenomenal excitement that you can imagine about 
being in the store at night when nobody's there, it just, uh, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was wonderful. And, and you know, it's become iconic too. Um, I'm sure it was great publicity for them as well. Um, and I know you always had the credits acknowledging them at the very end, but it's become iconic even to fans of the show. But believe it or not, Clive, there's fans that live in the States and fans that live in Canada that, because of today's special, have made an extra effort to go see. And there are still elements that are the same, although the store has been drastically remodeled since the show aired. Things like the, uh, the, the walk across that goes to the Eaton Center and the half moon window that you were talking about before are still in existence and there are fans out there that take pictures that remember the shots of those. Um, and uh, the opening sequence as well, that bay window is still there and the, the, the rotating doors. And, uh, and then of course many of them look for uh, you know, the plaque on the front that talks about it being part of the Hudson's Bay Company and you know, how that was all interwoven to uh, our story, parts one and two, about them trying to find the plaque so the building wouldn't get shut down. So it's really interesting <laughs> to see how that you know, is all solidified. You had mentioned uh, the three different places where you did live shows. There was that one hour special called Live On Stage. What, do you remember what specific theater that one was filmed in? It was in Hamilton Place. Hamilton Place. Yeah. Where was the main yeah. the main set? Where was that kept? Uh, the the main set was um, uh, was created in in a variety of places. Uh, uh, Peter Lucas ran a ran a studio, an external studio called Showline, and uh, there was uh, we originally started shooting out in Etobicoke, uh, where he had a studio, and then we went to his studio, Trinity Studios on uh, on uh, Cherry Street in Toronto. It, since uh, uh, it was uh, torn down um, uh, last year for uh, it's part of a huge new development, the West Donlands in Toronto. But uh, uh, Peter has another huge uh, sound stage further out. But uh, he was just starting his studio business when we were starting today's special, and uh, and we had a wonderful relationship uh, uh, with him. He had uh, he ran a great uh, studio. So basically, they were empty studios where TV Ontario brought its mobile in. So we had shoot from the mobile and. And uh, you know it was uh, it was an empty grid, so we had light it and uh, DSA built the sets, design services um, um, something like DSA, <laughs> um, and they uh, so we recreated the uh, uh, recreated the uh, the, uh, the the store uh, that was that was built in a studio, shot in the studio with three cameras, uh, and then. Interspersed the the, uh, uh, the the you know the night scenes at Simpsons and some location things and and Sam's rooms and Muffy's room and that kind of stuff as if it was in the store but of course you know everything but you know except the store items were uh, were shot in studio. Was Sam's computer room uh, studio in TV Ontario as well, or was that also outsourced? Uh, we did. Uh, I think we did some of that in uh, in uh, TV Ontario, but we did uh, uh, it, sometimes we we did it out by the studio because there were times when uh, we wanted to have a live feed between on Sam's monitor with somebody in the control room. So if Jody was in the control room and Sam could call them up on the security camera. It was an awful lot easier if we could do that live rather than having to sync videotape and that kind of um, that kind of stuff. Now, one of the questions that many fans have, and you know, like you said, these TV shows <laughs> they, they take on they take on a life of their own, Clive. And one of the ways that yes. many, one of the ways that the fans uh, s differentiate between uh, a certain amount of episodes of today's special and a certain uh, amount of other episodes, um, fans have actually split it into to, to two seasons. And they, they think of episodes that were before the episode changes, the opening episode in 1984, and what was after. And the reason why they do that is with good reason, of course. Uh, there were minor, minor, minor alterations to the theme song, and I know we talked about that, and I think I had to refresh your memory at the time. But more noticeably, and I think... It's I think not to refresh my memory. I didn't... I, didn't... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I had to play yeah. the clip yeah. to, to remind you. You see, this is, again, you know more about the show than I do. Right, you know? right, right. But, but with that specific episode, um, there were a lot of changes to the set. In the mind of a child, you know, this episode on changes, what a great way to teach about changes. But what was the ethos behind making all those changes? You know, there, you have the, the big Today Special sign that was now mounted to these kind of uh, um, uh, um, 
how would I say it? Uh, white and white and pink striped borders in the main in the main scene. Sam's computer room is probably the most. Uh, I've lost. Read- I've lost you, uh, Travis. I've lost you on your uh, on your feed. If you could repeat the question, I'd appreciate it. Oh sure, no problem. Um, I was just saying. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Okay. I was saying in the episode changes, there's all these drastic changes that, you know, as young children, people remember. Most notably, Sam's computer room totally got rehauled, um, looks completely different. And then Sam, uh, Muffy's uh, room has. Yeah, the, the I, uh, we're, we're breaking up again, but let me, let me see if I, can, uh, sure. if I can come up with a, an answer here. The uh, uh, partway through the series, we decided that we wanted to enrich the show, refresh the show, uh, create, you know, the first time you create a set, uh, sometimes it's not as effective or as, as efficient. Uh, it may, you may want to do some new things. So in Sam's room, we wanted it to be even crazier than it was before. Right. In Muffy's room, we wanted, we wanted to create a little more fantasy, a little more, a little more, uh, uh, you know, magic and romance and, and, and whatever. So, so, I mean, it's, sometimes it's, sometimes it's as simple as, sometimes it's as simple as the set's getting pretty, you know, pretty banged up and you're either going to have to make a new set or, you know, and, and in my view always was that if you could do a set that allowed the performers more opportunity to do wonderful things, to feel better about their character, to to enrich the show and show children, uh, you know, to do new things. Right. Uh, that so makes- that's you know, that's that's the reason. I mean, and sometimes you change things from a pilot to a series. For example. You know the today's special sign in the front. Right. You know, uh, you know, it was although it was lovely, and you got to see that shot. And I love the idea of tracking through the sign and into the into the store. It created real problems with key lights and shadows, and real problems with uh, you know uh, with camera movement and that kind of stuff. And and sometimes sometimes is this great shot that a director has in mind you know the director needs to take himself aside and say you know what it's causing more trouble than it's than it's worth and so sometimes you just bring it back for particular shots you know or for dance sequences or something like that you know tell me about you know you're so multi-talented you're a composer as well and you compose so much music for this series tell me about the challenges of composing and arranging original songs for a season's worth of shows, let alone a whole series. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Like, how many songs were in each episode? And, you know, were you grabbing from songs that you had composed from in the past, or was it all original? Um, my uh, uh, philosophy, unfortunately, is that uh, everything in the show needed to be original. So there was no ersatz uh, fill-ins in the, in the show. I mean, we, we did, you know, I mean, we did... Um, uh, takes on on Mother Goose and that kind of stuff, but they were always original. If it was an operetta, it was an original operetta with with original music. So um, uh, when performers came in, when Sharon Lewis and Bram came in to sing the, sh- the song, to sing a s- song or a number of songs, it it wasn't from their record. They re-recorded it for it. Oscar Peterson stuff was original. You know, when Karen Kane came in and danced. We wrote original music and recorded it for her, and that was, you see, that was part of the essence of the show, and it was part of my, uh, part of my philosophy, but part of our contract with the children's audience, you know, because if if an accountant comes in, they say, well, there's a way to to streamline the show, you know, you don't need so many production numbers, you know, you can, you know, you can. You know, you can have more talk stuff, and you can move it through faster. If you're doing, you know, more public domain music, it's less expensive. You know, why don't you just, you know, rip the, you know, the songs off of the existing records? You know, and 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 you can do it cheaper. And so, if you were in the if you were in the private world, then that's what you would do. My my goal was to that this would be. A rich experience for children, and we'd be providing 
original material to the marketplace, not not rehashed material to the marketplace. And I, I mean, that's that was part of our responsibility as public, you know, in public enterprise. We had an opportunity that private enterprise didn't have. You know? Would you be actually writing out the charts for your musicians for all of these original songs? And even when you were teaching them to the four main cast members, would you go so far to give them you know, a notated chart? Or would you just give them the lyrics and teach them by, by route and just play it and have them sing along? How, how, what was the process no, behind that? We, uh, the performers all had to read music. Uh, they, all had, they all had lead sheets with the, uh, with the lyrics and the music wow. on it. Uh, we would go into we'd go into rehearsal, and I mean, you know, I, I, I spent my life writing charts. You know, the band, uh, the band worked. Uh, you know, it was a six-piece band, and uh, we went into the finest recording studios, and these were great musicians, just phenomenal. So we worked off chord charts. Uh, you know, intros and that kind of stuff were written out, but uh, but the the uh, uh, you know the guitar players were doing. I wasn't writing guitar charts for them, and Jack Zaza, who played most of the uh, uh, the you know the flutes, the piccolo, the clarinet, the saxophone, the the whatever. Uh, I would I would on occasion write a chart for him, but he was just so fast, you know. He'd be transposing and just and filling in, and it was just you know. Great musicians can do that, right. you know, and and but you know, but everything everything was charted. I mean, you can't and and in uh, you know, we'd go into we'd go into rehearsal. We'd rehearse a number of shows and shoot some shows, then rehearse shows and then shoot shows and that kind of stuff. But we'd you know, we'd start a music rehearsal and we'd have heck, we'd have thirty songs to learn, you know, and uh, so we'd I'd just be you know. Here are the lead sheets, and and uh, you know here are your parts in the thing, and here's your harmony part. And okay, let's start playing it. And I'd bang it out in piano, and we'd run it through it, and we'd learn the thing, and we'd come back. You know, we'd have you know we'd have a rehearsal, and then we'd maybe have another rehearsal, and then the the band was all pre-recorded, uh, and so the the performers heard the the music played back to the floor. And then the performers sang it live in studio while they were performing. Oh wow! So if you were, if you were a puppeteer, you were doing that. If you were Jeff, you're you're dancing and singing, and uh, and it's being it's being you know so the the band fold back is low enough so it doesn't over you know it you know it doesn't wreck your vocal mic and that kind of stuff and. Uh, uh, again, I wanted that spontaneous. I didn't want lip sync. You know, I right. wanted, I wanted the spontaneous thing. And it's very hard for the performers, but uh, uh, but that's and that's why you had to have exceptional performers. You know, that, that's I mean, just... I think you know it, there may have been a couple of songs in the 120 shows, but in the 120 shows, and when when Jed McKay wrote his songs wrote his shows, he also wrote the songs for his show. So, so you know, 15% uh, of the shows were, were Jed's songs, but we'd, you know, we did the same thing. He would, he would send me a cassette of him singing it quietly in his, in his, uh, in his apartment at night, and I would, uh, you know, I'd write out the charts and, uh, and teach everybody the, uh, the, uh, the songs from the, uh, from the show. Well, that's remarkable because that sounds like a full-time job in and of itself, yet alone all your production and editing duties that had to go with it. Favorite songs that you wrote for the show? What are Just name off a couple of titles if you can remember any. Any that have endured. Maybe the ones that you can remember are the, are the ones that have endured in your mind. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, uh, the, I mean, the theme song is the... I, I, occasionally, I occasionally perform and... And uh, it's hard for me to perform without singing the, the theme song for today's special, even when I'm singing my, my pop stuff. And uh, I was doing a calculation uh, a while ago, and, uh, you know, that, that song has been ho heard over three billion times, you know, by people. You know, the, you know when you think of the, the, the size of audience and the number of times the show has been played. So it's, that's pretty remarkable. I think my favorite 
I've got two favorite songs from the show. I, uh, um, uh, In the Twinkle is a, is a, is a sh song that Jeff sang on the rooftop at night, you know, and, uh, and it was a beautiful set and uh, beautiful, and Jeff's just a brilliant guy. And the other, the other was Lullaby for Jeff, uh, which Muffy and Jeff uh, uh, sang uh, that was just so sweet between the two of them. It's a, and as, it's a special song for me. My, I sang it to my children when they were going to bed and my grandchildren. My daughter sings it to my grandchildren. So, so you know, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I think just, just really special for me. I mean, I think the song that, you know, another song that really resonates is a song uh, Clive Andersby wrote called Yo He Ho with me. And uh, it was, uh, you know, and the cow was blue and there's, you know, there's a, so there's a number of, a uh, number of songs that are, that are kind of iconic today's special songs and uh, you know, wonderful to be associated with them. Favorite episodes and why? Well, you know, I I think um, I think our story is my is my favorite uh, episode. And again, you know, I mentioned earlier about the watching the uh, the how the Lone Ranger got his you know you know. So I love shows about shows, and I th I think it was. You see, it's 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 funny, Travis. We have um, uh, you create the show. And you have all this kind of backstory in your mind, but you don't really, you know, you, you say, well, it's got to be a set, and somebody says the set has to be done by next Monday, so tell me what's in it. You know, you kind of make up a bunch of stuff. And then when we had a chance to do our story, we had a chance to go back and kind of create a backstory for the show that, of course, didn't that didn't exist. It was... Uh, it was um, you know, just a number of us who, you know, who love the show. Uh, Clive Andersby wrote the uh, the Our Story shows, and uh, and they were, um, um, you know, he was able to piece them together. He has a, a phenomenally creative mind, and and uh, was able to find ways to to make it work. And um, also, to, I mean, I mean, it's it's a lovely show because it's about. You know about family. Uh, you know a diverse, uh, you know non-nuclear family, but uh, a family who cared desperately about each other and worked together to save the store. And uh, um, you know, and so it was. Uh, yeah, and and to and to create an opportunity for Jeff to continue to live in the store and learn and uh, and uh, you know so. So there was a way to have a kind of backstory through line, uh, but uh, but people caring about each other, and I think, you know, being kind to one another, and and um, you know that was kind of the philosophy of the show, wasn't it? Well, I I have to say that our story was one of my favorites as well, and of course featured uh, Barry uh, Bald Baldro. Am I pronouncing his name right? Is Waldo Baldero? Baldero. Now, is, he, is he still with us? Is he still alive? I, I don't, I don't think so. But uh, he, he's, a, yeah, he was, he was just such a wonderful because he's an, you know, he, he was, yes, the most wonderful dry sense of humor. <laughs> it was, it was awfully hard to direct Barry because I was laughing so hard while he was doing it. He could do, he could do a slow take to any of the performers. You know, Barry Baldero and Bob Stutt playing Mort. You know, they were deadly characters <laughs> to try to direct because they were so they were so funny. Cheryl Wagner doing Mrs. Pennypacker, the same the same kind of thing. You know that they just um, and tell uh, us, tell they us, add so much richness. And tell us really quick. Um, obviously, you know, uh, tell what was the reason for introducing Mrs. Pennypacker? Because obviously, a, a, a later addition, she came into the show, but really was there kind of as a recurring person, as was you know Waldo the Magnificent. What was the uh, sense of that? Was it just to add variety and to add another character, keep interest? Yeah, yeah. It was. It was to expand the show. It was to add. Um, uh, uh, it, it, these things would happen when individual writers. Right. I mean, individual writers would be given would be given themes for the show, and inv individual writers would come back, and and 
it won't surprise you that some of them had little devilish kind of qualities to them, you know, that they would like to introduce something, you know, that was their own, that was their unique, you know, thing. And I would get these things and I just, you know, it would be a question of if the writer was introducing something that was going to add to the texture of the show. I wouldn't allow them to, to do things that were just, you know, that were just for themselves, you know, patronizing for, you know, or, you know, but if it enriched the show, because I knew that writers wanted to make their, their mark on the series, that performers wanted to make their mark on the series. So somebody came in with a new character or something special for a performer, uh, I wanted to encourage that because the best way to get, you know, the best performance out of people is to allow them to spread their wings. Now, it's to spread their wings within a context. You know, this was, it's not about, you know, it was never about me. It, you know, it was never about Jeff. It was never about Jody. It was about the audience. So if you could do that and you could do something special and the audience was going to be enriched, that was, that was something special. Now, there were times, uh, the time, you know, so I'd get scripts and I'd read the scripts and I would have, you know, we'd have a general understanding of where they're going to go, and, but I would read the script and it would be, it'd be new material to me. I know what they were kind of covering in curriculum, but it'd be new to me. And, you know, sometimes, you know, Candace Bist wrote a show uh, called, um, called Buttons. No, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Kate Lonsdale wrote a show called Buttons. And it was just, you know, she had done, she was doing four shows. And I think normally what we said is do three shows that are economical and in the fourth show you can do something that's a little that's a little different. Well, I, I, every time I see Kate Lonsdale now, I just say, well, you know, you know, you kind of went over the top with buttons. You know, it was it was a it was a plasticine world. It was a world on the moon. It was a it was just you know I had to I had to, I had to fly to New York to use some technology in New York to that uh, to do some of the stuff that she wanted to do. Joanne Hauser in one year I think she had just run out of rhymes and just couldn't stand rhyme. So she wrote a script where Muffy had uh, had laryngitis and couldn't talk. <laughs> so because she just couldn't she just couldn't bring herself to do any more rhyming couplets. And but it worked in context and uh, I think you know that um, one of the things that I try to do you know you try to if you try to control creative people too much, you uh, you know you just dampen down their spirit. But you have to have, but you have to be smart enough to to manage their expectations so that you can actually deliver. And sometimes, uh, sometimes the person who paid the terrible price was me because you had to figure out how you were actually going to do this. And you know, and it became a it became kind of a, a a lovely game for so that Noreen was able to push herself, and Jeff was able to push herself, and Sam was able to do things, and Muffy was able to do things, and we were able to do things technologically that that would would uh, make the crew phenomenally attached to the show. So and that was you know that's. That's part of the dance of being a producer and part of the opportunity that you, when you have enough money to do wonderful things, you know, so. We've taken a, a tally of some of the favorite episodes amongst the fans, and the top three are Butterflies, Phil's Visit, and Adventure. Any memories from those three? Oh, oh wow. Wow. Wow, well, that's really interesting. Well, of course, you know, Butterflies was about death, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we were trying to help children understand death. And, you know, this is, you know, Phil's visit was about alcoholism and to try to help children who were in an environment that might be abusive to reach out for help. Um, and, and those are those are two shows that 
that I'm not sure I would have the courage to do today if I were redoing today's special. They were shows that a socially conscious time and that kind of stuff. But but the the danger of television is that is that you can't control the environment in which your show is is seen. And uh, and this is this these are shows that were that we went out and got expert advice uh, uh, from Addiction Research Foundation, from, uh, psycholo- from psychiatrists, um, and, and, and we did the very best we could to write a script that would fit all of their needs, all of their recommendations. But we had no idea. You know, at one point, you know, 400,000 people were watching uh, today's special. So, you know, in 400,000 people uh, per episode, you, 406,000 people, so it was, it, was, it was stunning in Ontario. And that's an awful lot of, you know, that's an awful lot of the population, right? And, uh, but we have no idea of whether these children were watching in, in what kind of environment. So we tried to create through the, the, the leadership of Jody the strength of Sam, the vulnerability of Muffy. In, in the butterfly show, Muffy's butterfly dies, you know, and Jody and the rest of the group show compassion to Muffy to try to explain to her what death is, how to deal with that, you know, how, to, you know, how she's still loved, how she's still supported, you know, and, and but, you, you know, if you've lived through experiences of death, you just know how profound that is. And many children wouldn't have that kind of support structure. And in the alcohol thing is, is you, know, you know, you can imagine how dangerous it is for children to con- confront, you know, people who have, you know, who are, where they find themselves in al- alcoholic families and how dangerous that can be for children. Now, we... We took it on. I think we did it very responsibly, but but in hindsight, you know, that 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 t- television may not be the way to do it. Sesame Street did it with Mr. Mr. Hooper, right? Mm-hmm. And but that was a friend a friend that the children had experienced watching the show, and so they decided to deal with it head on, you know. And and we brought it in as you know just another show. So and it wasn't, of course, just another show. It was a, it was a show brilliantly written by Jed Mackay, brilliant, you know. And and I thought the performances. I was enormously proud of those shows, but it's a real challenge. Was there? Would you? Rece- would you Sorry, receive, go ahead. I was going to say, would you receive any criticism? Um, would you hear any criticism of those shows when they initially aired, or get any feedback, or read any fan mail? Uh, would, would there be anything that would be indicative of their... Because uh, amongst the Today's Special community, Phil's visit especially, is really regarded as, you know, put a feather in your cap, Clive, because a lot of people felt that, you know, your your bravery to deal with it meant a lot to people. And it's just amazing to even read through some of the comments of how that episode did the very thing that you wanted it to do in terms of helping uh, really rescue some some kids out of some not-so-great situations. So please be encouraged by it, because amongst the fandom there is... A real positive response, and I'm sure you're happy to hear that. But at the time, did you? Was there any indication? Could you gauge it at all? Uh, we uh, we did see, receive some uh, some feedback on the show. It was all positive. Uh, uh, you know, um, but you know, you don't hear feedback. You know, you don't that, hear it when it's bad. That, that, you don't hear feedback from. From children who were negatively affected, you would hear feedback from, and, and 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 alcoholic parents. I doubt would have sent us letters, uh, sure. you know, complaining about revealing their problems. But uh, uh, but 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 parents and organizations did support the show, and it was. Um, and again, we were we were enormously careful about the beats in the show and the things that we said and how to say it, and uh, and and it and it reflected in the show about supporting Muffy, supporting Sam, supporting you know Jody being the you know the nurturing character about Jeff 
discovering this stuff, but everybody, everybody rallying around uh, Muffy, who was so excited about Phil Finelli coming into the show and this famous photographer, and Sam being so so, so protective of of. Uh, the, the the character who came into the show was an alcoholic, a wonderful photographer, a friend of of Sam's, and and Sam eventually told him to leave the show because be, to leave the store because he didn't approve of the way that he was he was acting, and Muffy didn't know about drinking and didn't know about alcoholism and that kind of stuff, and we were trying to we were trying to show how how young children can be affected by this and how they must seek out support where they can find somebody they trusted uh, and to tell about this because they mustn't live, they mustn't have to live in, a, in an abusive environment. Biggest challenge in producing today's special, Clive? Um, um, Maximizing the talents of the people in the uh, um, creating an environment in which people could do their best work uh, in in a highly charged, highly you know um, uh, you know demanding environment. People worked like crazy mm-hmm. doing the show. You know, and and trying to take advantage of every skill that people had, but not crossing the line, so that you, um, uh, I mean, you know, to say I overworked people is true, you know, uh, but people, uh, but people wanted to. People people knew what was special about that show. Trying to maintain, you know, your a family life, <laughs> you know, while you were while you were doing this, because these opportunities don't come along very often. <clears throat> you know, I, I I can't think of very many opportunities like today's special that happened before that or hap- has happened in broadcasting after it. There are lots of great shows out there. But uh, this was a very special opportunity. Well, that leads perfectly into my next question. And we're rounding the corner here. It's become the, the visual history of so many young children, not, like worldwide, but especially in southern Ontario. You know, Clive, anybody who was born in, in the 80s, just this is imprinted on them. You talk about the show where the mannequin came to life, and they know about today's special. In your opinion, Clive, as the creator of the show, what is it, and I'm sure it's many things, but if you were to boil it down, what is it about today's special that has resonated with kids around the world and continues to resonate with it? There's a Facebook group, there's you know the petitions for it to be released on DVD. What is it about the lasting power of the show that you created? It was the um, it was the brilliance of the uh, of the writing and the uh, performance that there was um, uh, <clears throat> it was exceptional artistry and care both from a curriculum point of view and an execution on the on the screen. I've done lots of television and. Uh, uh, this uh, people knew that this was a this was an outstanding show. I mean, you had you had fine talent, you had great technical uh, backup, you had sufficient money to do the show. This was uh, you know a great a great moment in my life, but a great moment in the lives of many people who created it, and and I think that reflects. I think the care of the show reflects in the uh, in in that kind of longevity that the show that the show has had. I think I think that there was true, you know, love that transmitted through the uh, through the scripts and through the performance and through the editing and, and you know through the paperwork and all that and all that kind of stuff. You know, it was. I think you know if you if you ask the people who created the show, you know who worked on the show, who were in the technical part of the show, 
uh, they would re they would say that that was you know one of the great moments of their lives, and uh, so we were all blessed to be able to have that opportunity. 121 episodes, seven series that uh, aired on TV Ontario. Was it as popular when it ended as when it started, and could have it continued? I, I read a Toronto Star article recently from 1987. Um, that quoted Noreen Virgin even saying, you know, there had been thought about the performers trying to earn the rights, or, or pardon me, gain the rights to the show so that it could continue. Uh, was it as popular when it ended, and could it, could it have indeed continued? Uh, yeah, it, it could have. I mean, certainly from, a, from an audience point of view, it was, uh, uh, it, the audience was, uh, was greater at the end than at the beginning. I mean, it was uh, three times greater. Uh, it was developing worldwide reputation. Uh, um, it's, it's, imp it's, I think it's important to understand, the, again, the difference between uh, a, a governmental organization like TV Ontario and an industrial organization uh, like a private broadcaster or, a, or an independent producer. TV Ontario worked with a fixed amount of money every year. And so TV Ontario, in order to continue today's special, uh, had to use up, you know, a significant portion of its creative resources uh, for, uh, uh, for that show. And they were loyal uh, to the end and, uh, uh, and would, have continued the, would have continued the show. The, 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 the difficulty is that... One of the things about a children's program when you reach a critical mass like 120 programs is you can keep repeating that show as long as you own the rights to buying, buying out that. You know, the, by and large, the performers were paid out for a number of years in their contract, and so you could play the show an infinite number of times in those, in those years. If you ended the show the impact on the audience wouldn't be that great because you had, you know, young children go, you know, go, you know, they, they grow into the show and then they grow out of the show and a new group of children come along so you can play those children the 120 half hours and they see it as a new show. They don't see it as, a, as an old show. As adults, we see shows and they term it, you know, they That's end right. and we know them as, as uh, reruns. Well, part, of, part, of, it, part of the brilliance too in how you created it, Clive, and uh, you mentioned this before, was that uh, for reruns, every episode can stand on its own. There's not a continuation, you know, there's clearly character development if you look at it as a whole, but every episode of today's special can essentially stand on its own. So I think that's 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 brilliant in terms of uh, being able to you know show them again. Um, obviously, you know TV Ontario had repeats and whatnot. It, it's what it's not a series that you had to show in an order. Well, we we designed it we designed it so it was it was that way. We 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 couldn't. I mean, there were times when it was it was a new show would play at six thirty, and there would be a show at eight in the morning, a show at twelve, a show at you know you know at three o'clock in the afternoon and then and then the new show coming on at night so so that was part of the original design the point that I was getting to Travis was that by stopping the production of today's special money would be freed up within the children's department at TV Ontario to produce a new show and so uh, a new show like join in was produced with money that would have gone to today's special and it wouldn't have been produced otherwise and so now TV Ontario would have would still have Polka Dot Door on the air, would still have today's special on the air, and would now have join in on the air. Right. You know, so that so that uh, you know, I mean, from a performer's point of view, of course, the same performers don't get to work in the in the new show. Sure. And I, you know, I understand that. But uh, from a from a strategic uh, point of view at, at TV Ontario, they could have the benefit of today's special and also reap the benefit of of a new show as well and so you could have you know today's special on at Tuesday and Thursday at at 630 and join in on Wednesday and Friday at 630 and and that would you know that would 
extend the creative opportunities available for children watching TV Ontario. And as you see it, is that the reason why today's special came to an end, was to free up those funds to maximize the potential of creative programming that was on TV Ontario? Um, I decided to leave the show to go off to do other, uh, uh, um, to try to, to try to create a brand new show, you know, to create, to, to, to recreate the, you know, that wonderful new, ex that experience of creating something new, you know, and there's, uh, for creative people out there, they'll understand that, you know, the idea of, of maintaining a show as opposed to doing something new and it's it's the folly of many of us, uh, of many creative people, you know, that uh, because sometimes you can't recapture the essence of a of a of a show. Did you leave TV uh, but, Ontario after today's special? No, I stayed at TV Ontario, and I wanted to uh, I wanted to try a show for uh, children somewhat older, uh, and to try to create something because I thought that there was a, a need in the marketplace for uh, for you know, uh, a show that was older, and I thought that would challenge me to do something, uh, to do something uh, different. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I did some pilots, but I never was successful at, uh, at getting a, a long-running series off the, off the ground like today's special again. One of the million dollar questions, wanting to know by the fans, and I know that there's a lot of intri intricate answers to this, but succinctly maybe you could tell me, why will today's special never be released on DVD? Um, uh, it, it has to do with rights. Um, uh, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the private market, uh, by and large, producers uh, uh, produce shows and they buy out all rights in perpetuity for a show. So they'll buy out, you know, perhaps not residual rights, but rights for DVDs. And certainly every producer these days is buying, you know, that's part of the contract. In TV Ontario's time when, when this show started, uh, there was no such thing as DVDs. There was no such thing as, you know, there was, you know, you know home, you know, there was no home market for this kind of thing. And so the contracts, both for the writers, the writers, the actors, and the musicians, uh, were specific to television production, and were specific to uh, had had certain time limits on them. And you know, where where at the CBC, for example, uh, you paid for every repeat. TV Ontario got tremendous deals from the Musicians Union and the ACTRA and from what is now the Writers, uh, uh, the Writers Guild uh, to allow them to repeat programs and to play them into schools. You know, they got what are called VIPs rights, uh, video, I, I can't remember what, it is, what its name's for, but to allow them to play in the schools. So the, the, the acting unions and the writers' unions and the musicians' union already gave TV Ontario very special deals, taking into account that they were an educational and less rich market than, than some other markets. So now to come back and say, well, we want the same commercial rights you know, the, uh, the acting, uh, all the unions will say, well, that's great. Here's what you have to pay for those rights. And those, and, and, and it's one of the dangers of creating a show that's full of all original stuff, original script, or lots of performers, lots of music, lots of musicians, and it just becomes prohibitively expensive to go to the unions and to and to buy out those rights and again where you know if you were doing it today um, you know maybe not with TV Ontario but with with another producer you would buy all those rights up, up front and so the performers made less and with the idea that if you were ever going to buy those rights out again uh, they would get they would get step ups and uh, and it turns out that if you wanted to buy out a show like this, it would cost so much money, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't make your money back by releasing DVDs. And so, you know, it is, it has been a thorn in the side of of performers, you know, because in a sense, 
you know, they want, you know, so many people want these things to be out there, but, you know, the, the, the rights issues would make it so expensive to, uh, uh, to release them. So it's not, it's not TV Ontario not wanting to do it, it's TV Ontario being bound by the, by the original uh, contracts that the performers uh, uh, signed here. So if they wanted to bring today's special back to the marketplace, they would have to pay all the performers again, all the writers again, all the, all the musicians again, where if, if an independent producer who has bought all those rights out in the beginning wants to bring a DVD out, they just press the DVD and, and the performers tend not to get any money for it, you know. So it's, it is, a, you know, it's lovely that the show is loved so much, but, you know, you know you'd have to sell millions of DVDs to make back the investment. So TV Ontario no. effectively owns today's special. Now, recently, uh, they have posted some episodes and cleared them uh, for featuring on part of their public archive, and it's just been a selected few. Do people like you, the creator, do you, do you see any benefit from that? Uh, do they have to clear any copyrights or pay out any copyrights to use the creator or, they, or, or the performers to have those specific episodes available online? Uh, uh, from a from a, uh, a producer director point of view, creator they own all the rights, so they can uh, uh, TV Ontario. Uh, um, I, I was on staff at TV Ontario, and and the way that that works is that they own all the rights for it. Right. As a as a composer, um, uh, 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 I would own you know I own the uh, I own the rights to the songs and the. And if you know, I played the I played keyboards and synthesizers. So if they had to pay if they had to pay the musicians, I would get a I would get a portion of that. I haven't uh, I haven't opened up a, a an account in the Bahamas uh, as a result of that. <laughs> Have you retained? <laughs> but yeah, you know, listen, you've got the you've got the number you had the number one song and you know on Billboard. So you know you know more about that than I do, right? <laughs> Oh my goodness, you're you're kind. Have we have we have you retained any merchandising, any pictures, any photos, any mementos? I know when we met, you were so kind to give me a pin. Uh, anything that you retained from the show, anything hanging in your house, any manuscripts of the the theme music notated, anything like that that you maintained? I know often as creators, we we're, we're on to the next thing, and, and I know that as a musician. But is there anything that hangs in your house, or anything that you've kept as a memory of the show? I have a. I have a uh, like like a number of people that uh, I've got a, a jacket of today's special that's that's carefully uh, uh, in my memento uh, Tupperware, you know, with my children's blankets and you know the, the blankets from my children. I have a I, in my in my house. I have a I have a a, 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 f, a photo of the uh, of the cast signed photo of the cast. And crew, and I have a I have a, a picture of uh, of one of the dance sequences of uh, of uh, Jeff and Karen Kane up in my wall that uh, are wonderful reminders of the uh, of the show. That's wonderful. Nina Keo shared with me when I interviewed her that she actually has a, a blooper reel from the from the cast party at the very end that she enjoys watching from time to time. She said that there's some some eventful things that happened on that on that reel. Um, you mentioned as a, as a director, you have to you have to try to control your uh, uh, your crew towards the end of the year, so they're not spending a lot of time uh, doing bloopers as opposed to actually <laughs> doing the series. You mentioned briefly that uh, special rights were cleared for today's special to be shown in schools, and in fact, that was my experience in the public school system. Uh, I remember watching episodes. Was there, to your knowledge, a curriculum that was built for the show that would be sold to schools along along with the show? No, no, there wasn't. Finally, just last two questions here. Um, any any specific memorable? today's special stories or trivia that fans maybe find interesting aside from what you've shared already anything off the top of your head that you may be interested to know that I still have Jeff's hat and I secretly put it on at night <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think there are a lot of people that would like to have a Jeff's hat you sure. know and, uh, uh, it was uh, 
um, uh, that, you know, when we started the show, if you started a series now, Travis, you would, you would, uh, you know, make sure that material that was in the hat was available, you know, that you had more than, you bought more than a yard of it, you know. Right. So, um, we had a heck of a time with, with, uh, with the hat and some of the other material in Jeff's outfit, uh, uh, particularly in, uh, in the, uh, our story show. Uh, we had a we had a, had to make a series of hats so we could you know we chroma keyed it through the air. Goodness, the, you know the the technology that's available now that wasn't available then. You know the kind of homemade television things that we had to do to to uh, make make things fly and do all the fantasy things that I wanted to do in the show. So uh, there aren't enough hats out there because because uh, we couldn't find that material again. You know. <laughs> So there, you know, you know, it's inter interesting when you start a show, you know, you have hopes and dreams for the show, but we had no idea that it was going to have the impact that it had. Yeah. You know, and th that when we did the pilots, then we were blown away by, you know, I remember playing the pilots for, you know, the executives at TV Ontario, and we were in a boardroom playing it. And you know, sometimes you know, at the end of the thing, it, 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 I'd played things before, and people were tried to be polite or had critical comments or, or whatever. And at the end of the pilots of today's special, it was just applause. Wow. It was I'd never experienced something like that. That you know, they just they knew that this was a special special show, and 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 for eight years or so, they 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 funded it differently than any other show at TV Ontario. You know, it was just, they just kind of knew how special this was and, and crews tried to get on the show and performers tried to get on the show. And it was, and you know, when we asked, when we asked, you know, exceptional talent to be on the show, if they were available, they did it. You know, we were never turned down by, we were turned down by people because they, they weren't available at the times we could shoot. But uh, we were never turned down because because the word got out that the show was you know was special. It really sounds like it was the darling of TV Ontario during the 1980s, and I, I it makes sense with with the amount of people that just remembered it. Any notable compliments that you've gotten through the years from any celebrities, or maybe just personal notable compliments that have that have meant a lot to you about the show? No, listen, I. I um, uh, the it is it's the impact on young children uh, I this is you know I mean it was a television show we were we worked hard to make it you know as beautiful as it possibly could be but but parents and children you know love this show and to to be to be allowed to be a part of of so many families and to and to have an idea to to you know to be able to do something that enriches children's lives that's a you know that's a great gift that's you know, a great gift you know clive you've been so blessed you've you've been a not only a television creator but you've been a composer you have been a, a high school uh, pardon me a college professor and lecturer um, when you look back on your time at TV Ontario, um, which work are you most proud of? And when you think about everything that you set out to do, uh, all your goals that you had uh, during those times that you were, you were working at TV Ontario, and, and the goals that you had in terms of what your influence wanted to be on this industry, do you feel like you accomplished it? Yeah, well, y yes, yeah. I mean, I, I just, I feel blessed. I uh, I worked with spectacular people at, at TV Ontario who were, you know, so hardworking that they, um, you know, in an, in every part of the show, you know, in in administration, in the technical realms, and the, you know, uh, um, it was a it was a great opportunity. I you know, do you always want to do more? You bet. You know, it's part of the creative it's part of the gr creative drive. Uh, but, uh, but part of, um, part of the maturity is to sit back and, and not savor how brilliant you were, but how, 
lucky you were to be able to, you know, be at a be there at a time where there was a kind of confluence of all that talent and all those uh, resources and all that all that um, you know generosity uh, to and that it that it actually came together and, and created something that was uh, uh, that we're that we're still talking about today. I mean, you know, for you to be doing this and and for other people to care enough about the show, you know, is is a pretty phenomenal reward, don't you think? Well, it's very true, Clive, that people really do love you and love what you created and, you know, love your brainchild. Would you consider today's special one of the, the crowning jewels of your time at, at TV Ontario in, in, in terms of personal accomplishment, in terms of personal fulfillment and the ability to, to do that show? Would that be one of the shows that stands out? Yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. It was, uh, I mean, there were many, there were many shows that I, that I loved doing, but, uh, but this is, the, this is the one that had the, uh, that resonated uh, uh, most deeply with an audience, you know. Well, it, it certainly has, and I want to thank you so much for taking so much time to kind of go down memory lane and uh, answer questions <laughs> that have been philosophical in nature and questions that are just detailed questions that I know fans are going to be interested in knowing. And uh, I know what it's like being a, a, a composer and a creator, you know, people will ask myself, you know, details about things and just like, you know, in some of your responses tonight, it's like, well, I've never really thought of that. And that just seemed like the, the way to go with it at the time. You know, sometimes there's not a, you know, a story behind the story, but it has been just wonderfully, wonderfully uh, wonderful. To, to spend this time with you and to, to do this interview. And I, my, my heart, I know I shared this with you going into this, was just to, just to communicate the honor we want to give you, you know, as a real industry leader in, uh, in Ontario, but a man who's had an effect on the entire world and in the landscape of children's programming. And I think uh, we are very blessed and very lucky to have you. And I know that people will watch this for many years uh, to come and they will be encouraged to, to hear about your life and to, to know, too, that they, too, can have uh, a fulfilling, rewarding life that accomplish, accomplishes the things that you have done. And you've inspired so many people. So be encouraged. And uh, I know we'll chat a couple of minutes after I shut off record here. But thank you so much for taking the time, all two and a half hours, to, to, to tell us about the show and to, to tell us about your career. We are blessed by you, Clive, and we appreciate you. Thank you, Travis.